This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by short wave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And now let's visit our old friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Settle yourself down and get your pipe going. Thanks. Doctor, last week you told us that tonight's story took place in the Casbah at Algiers. Yes, the Casbah. I remember it as the place of countless streets winding up and down, past colorful cafes where a hundred tongues were spoken, and often a street would end in shadowy darkness which a man would be foolhardy to enter alone. Yes, Mr. Bartell, that was the Casper that Sherlock Holmes and I knew in that winter of 99. Well, how did you happen to be out there, Doctor? <laughs> Do you mind if I tell you the story from the start, Mr. Bartell? It really began on a wintry night in Baker Street at the conclusion of the strange murder in Montrevor Castle. A charming young girl sat on the sofa of our lodgings in Baker Street and talked to us. But, Mr. Holmes, you can't say you'll have nothing more to do with the Montrevors. My dear Miss Tretfield, I found the true murderer of the Dowager Countess and he committed suicide. Surely the case is ended. Yes, Mr. Holmes, you found the real murderer. But now I want you to find the unfortunate young man who fled England five years ago when he was suspected of a crime. This is a new development, Miss Tetfield. Uh, please tell us about it. It's Douglas Milton that I'm talking about. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He was the heir to the title, wasn't he? Yes, Mr. Holmes. He was a sensitive, artistic boy, and, and when he knew that he was under suspicion, he ran away. Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone regarded his flight as an, as an admission of guilt. That is, until you found the real culprit, Mr. Holmes. I imagine, Miss Tretfield, that your interest in the missing boy is not entirely, shall we say, uh, altruistic? I'm in love with him, Dr. Watson. Oh. We were engaged to be married when he ran away. Mr. Holmes, you've got to find him. He must know that his name has been cleared and that he's inherited the title. Miss Tretfield, uh, have you any direct news, any letter from your fiancé since he left five years ago? None. Any clues as to his hiding place? Only this. It's a painting I received anonymously a year after he had left. Oh. It was sent from a forwarding address in London. Here it is, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Yes, a small oil painting. Very good one, too, I say. Yes. It's a splendid sense of composition, and his use of color is unusually brilliant. You recognize this painting as the work of your fiancé, Miss Stratfield? I'm certain of it. Yes. Wonderful use of color. Observe the delicate shadings of that sunset. And the brilliant green of the oasis. This scene is extraordinarily reminiscent of the desert in North Africa. Yes, yes, that's what made me say I was certain he'd gone abroad, Mr. Holmes. But why should he go to North Africa? A good place, Watson, for an Englishman who imagines himself to be escaping justice. Remember, the foreign legion is stationed there. You think he might have joined the legion, Mr. Holmes? Right. It would seem logical. No questions are asked to those who join it, and its colorful obscurity might easily appeal to a young fellow in trouble. Hello. What is it, Holmes? Oh, quite a few grains of sand in between the canvas and the frame here. Miss Tretfield, do you mind if I pry the canvas loose? Do anything you like, Mr. Holmes, if it gives you any clue to Douglas's whereabouts. Give me your penknife, will you, Watson? Uh, uh, Thanks, old chap. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, here we are. Can you see anything? Uh-huh. Look. The word sheriff. An Ella Froon. A stamped here. Sheriff is probably the framer's name, and Ella Foon is a town some 50 miles from Algiers. That settles it. Miss Stratfield, I accept your case. Watson and I will go to Africa and try to find your fiancé, Douglas Milton. Monsieur Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. I have heard of you so often, but I never thought I should see you here at the headquarters of the Foreign Legion. What can I do for you, gentlemen? Well, Colonel Brisson, I'm uh, trying to trace an Englishman who has been missing during the past four years. I have reason to believe that he uh, might have joined the Legion. Yeah, I shall look in my records. Uh, let me see, four years ago would be 1895. Uh, 
If Sherlock Holmes is tracking him, then I suppose he was in trouble in his own country. If he was in trouble, he might easily have come to us. We ask no questions. 97, 96, ah, 95. In that year, three young Englishmen joined us. One of them died of dysentery two years ago in Sideraji. One of them deserted 18 months ago, and we have been unable to trace him. The third is my adjutant who brought you into my office just now. And he is, I would say, about um, three inches shorter than Douglas Milton. And men do not uh, shrink in the foreign legion, eh, Colonel? <laughs> they do not, Miss Jones. <laughs> and the fellow who deserted must be our man. Unless it's the one who died of dysentery. Colonel de Brisson, how would you advise us to set about trying to find a deserter? Monsieur Holmes, there's only one place in Algeria where a man can hide from the Foreign Legion and remain here. Oh, and what's that place? The Kasbah in Algiers. Then that's our destination, Watson. Uh, be very careful, mm -hmm. please, gentlemen. The Kasbah is a place where the law is exiled. The police have no jurisdiction there. The only rule is that of strength, violence, and trickery. We'll be very cautious, I assure you. Goodbye, Colonel Le Brisson, and thank you for your help. <laughs> I must say that I think Colonel de Brisson rather exaggerated the dangers of the Caspar. <coughs> I suppose you're going to tell me this cafe is the headquarters for a dope smuggling ring or white slaving or something. Its ramifications are even more extensive than those you've mentioned. You're joking, Holmes. I assure you I'm not, old fellow. What? My old friend Juamel is chief of police in Algiers. When I told him our mission, he advised me to come here. A 500-franc note and the proprietor can obtain any and all information regarding the underworld. For as little as 200 francs, he can arrange a murder. So that gives you some idea of the relative values in the Caspar. Good Lord, then you've already spoken to the proprietor? Oh, yes, yes. A charming scoundrelly fellow by the name of Rafi. I gave him 500 francs and asked him to set his underworld grapevine in motion to see whether an Englishman living in hiding here in the Caspar could be found. And I thought we'd come here for a quiet meal. <laughs> here comes Rafi now. Let's hope he has news for us. Here we are, Rafi. Come and sit down, won't you? Uh, Rafi works fast, does he not, Mr. Holmes? Uh, uh, your friend is... My friend knows that you're working with me. We'll be found out. A, a drink first. The tongue of Rafi is parched. <laughs> Would you have me die of thirst before I give you my news? Vermouth cassis. Tibitisi, Rafi. You have news for me, then? Uh, but yes. Good, what is it? First, you will pay me more money, no? Uh, but I gave you 500 francs. You said that you'd do the job for that. Uh, can I help it if some tongues are more costly to make wag than others? <laughs> it took the 500 to get the wag. Am I to have nothing for my own trouble? But vermouth cassis, Missy Rafi. Ah, good, good. Uh, the gentleman will pay for it. There you are. Missy, Missy. I will drink to your health, gentlemen, both of you. You will pay me more money, no? If my friend's already given you 500, you should stick to your bargain, my good fellow. My information is a bargain at 750 francs. It would be a bargain at 1,000, but Rafi will let you have it for 750 <laughs> because he likes you. <laughs> you will give it to me, no? And if I refuse? <laughs> then you get no information, and uh, perhaps I spread news in the Casbah that makes it uncomfortable for you gentlemen to be there. Great Scott, this is blackmail. Uh, I get the money, <laughs> no? <laughs> You're a scoundrel, Rafi. Of course I'm a scoundrel. <laughs> Here's your money. An information? There is an Englishman hiding here in the Casbah. I do not know his name, but he is tall and fair-haired. I cannot tell you where he lives, but if you go to the cafe of a thousand sighs, you will find a girl who sings there. A girl who sings like a nightingale. Her name is Aisha, and she can lead you to your Englishman. A girl named Aisha... The Café of a Thousand Sighs. That is right. I would suggest that you go there in disguise. Two well-dressed Englishmen might find themselves in trouble. 
For a small fee, say 200 francs, I will escort you uh -huh, there myself. Thank you, thank you, yes. I, I think we can manage by ourselves, Rafi. Oh, uh, if your business is concluded quickly and time weighs heavy on your hands, Rafi can take you to some places of rare interest. Dancing girls that wither one's eyeballs with their beauty. <laughs> For 500 francs, gentlemen... Uh, thank I... you, Rafi, thank you. I have a feeling the time will not weigh heavily on our hands. Good night. You work too hard, gentlemen. You should learn how to play. Good night. <laughs> on my soul, I think that fellow's the biggest blackguard I ever met. <laughs> I quite agree, old chap, but he is amusing. Uh, by the way, Holmes... Uh... Don't you think that when this case is finished, we might have a time on our hands? Oh, 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 Watson, you're incorrigible. But I think... Watson. What is it? Got the man sitting over in the corner by himself. I do, yes. His, his face seems familiar. We've seen him before somewhere. Of course we have. His name is Oliver Leeming. We met him at the inquest on the Montrella case. So we did. Now, what on earth do you suppose he's doing here in the castle? Mm -hmm. Not on a holiday, I'm sure. Mr. Oliver Leeming, if you recall, is a, a cousin of Douglas Milton's. The man's a man we're searching for. If Milton were ever declared legally dead, Mr. Leeming over there would uh, inherit the title. It looks to me as if we're not the only people in the Casper who are searching for the missing heir. That's too old, fellow. Come on, let's go and talk to the gentleman. Oliver Leeming. I'm very odd to meet you here. Well, well. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, won't you sit down? Thank you. World's a small place, isn't it? Or has somebody said that before? I wondered if you'd spot me over here in the corner. Oh, you saw us then. Of course. But you seem to be in such deep conversation with that scoundrel Rafi. <laughs> I didn't like to disturb you. Very considerate of you, I'm sure. Why are you here, Mr. Leeming? Oh, I'm making a business trip. This is my day off. As I recall it, um, you're in the publishing business. Correct. What a memory you have. Uh, it Holmes. seems peculiar that you should uh, be on a business trip here. Are you planning on opening a publishing house in Algiers? Or are you uh, searching the Casbah for new authors? Why not? I'm a great believer in encouraging new talent. Mr. Leeming, why don't you admit that you're here for the express purpose of trying to find your cousin, Douglas Milton? Mr. Holmes, you've discovered my secret. The great Sherlock Holmes and his watchdog have their eagle eyes on me. They know that I succeed to the title if Douglas Milton dies. Yes, Mr. Leeming, we know that fact. And you have fathomed my plan to find Douglas before me and kill him so that I may inherit the title. How lucky I am to meet you in the Casbah, where you cannot arrest me. <laughs> well, it's a race against time, gentlemen, but I have a head start, as you will soon find out. Goodbye, and the best of luck to you. Oh, extraordinary fellow. He's joking, of course. I believe not, Watson. I think he labors under the whimsical belief that the best method of discounting the truth is to state it as boldly so that it will not be believed. Great Scott, then we must work fast. Yes, old chap, we must. I'm sure that we're entrance in a race against death. We must get back to the hotel and into our disguises as quickly as possible. After that, we shall visit a young lady named Aisha in the cafe of a thousand sighs. And I'm certain, Watson, that it will be the first time two men have ever entered the Casbah for the express purpose of preventing a murder. Well, Doctor, I can hardly wait to hear what happened next. You and Sherlock Holmes went back to the hotel, I suppose. Yes, Mr. Bartell. Holmes quickly adopted the disguise of an Arab guide... Well, I assumed the role of a tourist, and we started off on our search. Outside the cafe of a thousand size, we met with the rude shock. Good Lord. It's the fellow we met in the cafe. Yes, Oliver Lee Ming, with a knife between his shoulders. He's dead, Holmes. Shouldn't we get in touch with the police? What can they do? Remember, there is no law on the Casbah. In any case, this man is beyond our help. Our job is to protect the living. Come on, old fellow. Let's go to the Café of a Thousand Sighs and find this girl, Aisha. The girl, Rafi says, sings like a nightingale. Je l'appelle, ma petite bourgeoise. 
Mettons qui qui, mettons qui qui, mettons qui noirs. Il y en a d'autres qui me font le doux yeux, mais c'est elle que j'aime le mieux. So, so that's the girl I used to. She, she's very beautiful. Don't forget our role of tourist and guide, old chap. Master, would wish to meet this Aisha? Uh, very much indeed. I will see if it can be arranged, Master. Wait here for me, Watson. I'll see what I can do. Right, right you are, Holmes. Be careful now. Mademoiselle Aisha. What do you want, greasy one? There is an Englishman at the table over there. He wishes to talk to Aisha. Which one is he? The man who sits at the table in the corner. He is very rich, Aisha, and he admires you a great deal. He told me to give you this 500 franc note. So? Very well. You may bring him to my rooms. The door is at top of stairway, to the right. Good, Aisha. I fetch him. I shall be waiting. I shall well see you, Master. Follow me, please. Oh, very well. I hope you know that you're going to handle this, Combs. Don't worry, Watson. In this case, I think honesty will be the best policy. Well, I'm not so sure. This place is a thieves' kitchen if ever I saw one. You better be careful. First door to the right at the top of the stairs. This is it. Come in. Oh, come and sit over here, Mr. Englishman. Greasy one, you may leave us. Mademoiselle, I uh, may as well tell you at once that I am not an Arab guide. My name is Sherlock Holmes. What do you want with me? Why you trick your way in here? Don't be frightened, mademoiselle. I can explain our mission in a very few words. My friend and I have come in search of an Englishman by the name of Douglas Milton. We have good news for him. What make you think I might know of him? A gentleman by the name of Rafi suggested that you might. What is your good news for this Englishman? That he has been cleared of suspicion of murder and that he is the rightful Earl of Montreva. That means when he knows this, he will leave the Kasbah and return to his country? Naturally, madame. I do not know this man. I have never heard of him. Here is your 500 francs. Goodbye. Not so fast, Aisha, mon petit chou. I've been listening from behind these curtains. Gentlemen, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Douglas Milton. Douglas Milton, we found you at last. It gives me infinite pleasure to have succeeded in my mission. How do you do, sir? This is very exciting. Yes, I think the occasion calls for a drink. Uh, What will it be, gentlemen? Well, I think a a glass of port would be very nice, sir. Yes, it would be the most appropriate for toasting the new Earl of Montreva. Splendid, splendid. Aisha, uh, bring glasses and a bottle of port and some uh, creme de menthe for me. You are not going to England. I will never let you leave me. Oh, stop being so melodramatic, Aisha. Please bring two bottles and some glasses. Very well. I am sorry. Mr. Holmes, I can't tell you how I appreciate your trouble in coming all this way to find me, but I must tell you at once, there's one problem that makes it difficult for me to leave this country. You see, I... I deserted from the Foreign Legion. Yes, 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 we know that, my boy. In fact... That's how we first got onto your trail. I shouldn't let that fact worry you, Mr. Milton. I'm certain the British consul in Algiers can arrange to have any charges dropped against a peer of the realm. Oh, well, I, I, I never thought of that. Here are the bottles. Well, you must excuse the glasses, gentlemen. Tumblers are hardly correct, I suppose, but... Well, they won't spoil the flavor, I'm sure. Ah, two glasses of port and uh, a creme de menthe for me. Only three glasses, Aisha? Bring a glass for yourself. I do not wish to drink. And I insist that you do. Bring a glass, Aisha. Why should I drink if you are leaving? Mr. Milton, uh, do you know Oliver Leeming? Of course, he's my cousin. He came here half an hour ago and threatened me. Did you also know that he's lying dead in the street? Murdered? Well, yes, yes, I did. If we went in the cars, I wouldn't tell you this, but... Aisha stabbed him. She followed him when he left here. He killed him and then slipped back just in time to sing a song a few moments ago. 
Oh, you needn't look so shocked, Dr. Watson. Life is cheap in the Cosper, and Aisha is a girl of violent passions. Come on, let's let's drink. A toast to the new Earl of Montreva. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me, sir, you took the wrong glass. You were drinking my port. Oh, silly mistake. I can't bear port. Very un-English of me, I'm afraid, but, well, after all these years, I don't feel particularly English. In fact, I'll probably find it very hard to adjust myself to the old life when I go back. Or perhaps I should say, if I go back. Since you feel that way about it, Mr. Milton, why go? You can claim the title and the revenues of the estate without leaving Algeria. You could stay here and live on the income. I didn't realize that would be possible. Are you sure I could do that? Oh, yes, I'm quite certain of it. Hmm. But if you doubt my word, I suggest we all adjourn to the British consulate in Algiers. They can put you straight on the matter. That's a good idea. Let's go over there at once. No, no, I've been listening to you, my friend. You are planning to leave me. Once you go from the Casbah, I shall never see you again. Put down that knife, Aisha. I will not let you go. You belong to me. If you try to leave me now, I will kill you. Put down that knife, Aisha. You've done enough damage for one night. Why, you... Put it down, you fool. Put it down. Let me go. Let me go. Ah. She twisted the knife on herself as she fell. Holmes, help me turn her over. She's dead, Mr. Milton. Poor Aisha. It's a bloody path that leads to the Montrevor title, sir. I suggest that we see that this poor girl's body is taken care of. Then go to the British consulate without any further delay. Now that we're at the consulate, Mr. Milton, I suggest that you swear on oath that you are Douglas Milton, heir to the Montrevor estate. This gentleman is a commissioner of oaths, and we can go in and see the consul. Very well. Uh, now, uh, rise the right hand, please, and repeat after me. I hereby solemnly swear that I am Douglas Milton, the missing heir to the Montrevor estate. I hereby swear that I am Douglas Milton, missing heir to the Montrevor estate. Thank you, sir. And now, if you'll sign the statement here, these gentlemen can witness it. There you are. Thank you, sir. And now, if uh, you gentlemen will sign. Yes, certainly. Thank you, gentlemen. The document is now legal. Splendid. Now let's go over and see the consul. Not yet, my friend. Watson, this man is not Douglas Milton. What the devil are you talking about? There is no law on the Casbah, sir, so you cannot be punished for the two murders you committed there. But now that your avarice has tempted you here to Algiers where you've been foolish enough to sign a false statement, I think we can at least settle you very nicely for desertion, false impersonation, forgery and perjury. Holmes, what do you mean? The story should be obvious, old fellow. Oliver Leeming did track down the deserter. Recognition was uncertain after so many years, but at least it gave this gentleman the idea of impersonating the real Douglas Milton, a friend of his. And you have a lively imagination, Mr. Holmes. The real Douglas Milton... Died of dysentery two years ago in Cité Rage. As soon as the idea of impersonating Milton was born, Leeming had to die. Your theories are very interesting, but you haven't a shred of proof. I say that I'm Douglas Milton. How are you going to prove otherwise? Very simply, my dear sir. Douglas Milton was a painter. A painter who excelled in the use of vivid colors. You, sir, suffer from the quite common malady of red-green color blindness. Less than an hour ago, you mistook a glass of port, which is red... For a glass of creme de menthe, which is green. I knew at once that you were an imposter. You're cleverer than I thought you were, Holmes. Goodbye. Here, here, come back. No, no, Watson. Don't go after him. But we can't let him escape, Holmes. Don't worry, old chap. He won't escape. I sent a message to Colonel de Brisson. If you go to the window, I think you'll find that the consulate is being watched. The Legion has a long memory for desertion. I don't think he'll get very far. <laughs> They got him, Holmes. Shot him as he was trying to run away. A just death for him. He lived a life of violence and treachery, Watson. It's only fitting that he should die in the same manner. Doctor, that was a swell story, but 
You know something? I, I wish you hadn't disillusioned me about the Casbah. I disillusioned you? Why? What, what do you mean? Well, before I heard your story, whenever somebody mentioned the Casbah, I'd always visualize a very glamorous, romantic sort of place full of beautiful women. Every one of them a ringer for Hedy Lamar. No. Yep. And I could just see myself, handsome, dashing, going up to one of those beautiful girls and whispering in my fine French accent, Darling, you're a sensational. You're a lovely, gorgeous. Tell me. Have you ever tried Petri wine? It's wonderful. Well, you must admit, Doctor, that that is the truth. <laughs> it is wonderful wine. It certainly ought to be. You're incorrigible. <laughs> After all, winemaking has been the business of the Petri family ever since way back in the 1800s. For generations, the Petri family has handed down from father to son, from father to son, the fine art of turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. And don't forget, because the making of Petri wine is a family affair... The letters P-E-T-R-I on a bottle of wine are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. So no matter what type of wine you prefer, for any occasion, remember you can't go wrong with a Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Doctor, now I suppose you're ready to tell us about next week's story? Yes, and as soon as I have, I want you to meet a friend of mine friend? Yes. But first, Mr. Bartell, next week, I'm going to tell you an adventure in which, for once, Holmes came off second best. An exciting story of high society and romance. I call it A Scandal in Bohemia. Boy, that sounds swell. And now, what about your friend? Well, he's waiting at the microphone in San Francisco. He's Dr. Langley Porter, and he wants to tell us about something very important. Dr. Langley Porter. Thank you, Dr. Watson. Radio listeners, tonight in Italy there are thousands, many thousands, dying of cold and hunger. Babies, children, expectant mothers, old folks, dying for want of clothes, want of food. This organization, American Relief for Italy, appeals to you to search your homes for anything that can be made useful for starving, freezing men, women, children. Clothing, layettes for babies, diapers, shoes, food, surgical supplies, but above all, clothes, clean clothes, fit to wear. Take them to the nearest fire station. That your gifts will reach the Italians who need them, you may be sure. Americans of this organization will distribute the packages in Italy through the Italian Red Cross, the Catholic Relief Organization, the League of Italian Women, the Confederation of Italian Labor, and the Italian government. In California, rationing has gone. Christmas comes. There, in Italy, death is on the prowl. Radio listeners, lives can be saved. It's up to you. Thank you, Dr. Langley Porter. I know that our friends listening in will do all that they can to help the organization American Relief for Italy. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Crooked Man. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. 
And now I know Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You're quite muffled up tonight, I see. Overcoat, scarf, and gloves. Slip them off and come and join me by the fire. Thanks, Doctor. It's quite a nip in the air tonight. Yes, there is indeed. Well, Doctor, you told us last week that tonight's story centered around the activities of a brilliant and beautiful woman. Yes, my boy. Her name was Irene Adler. But I never knew Holmes refer to her by any other name than the woman. (laughs) She sounds mighty intriguing. Uh, How did you happen to meet up with her? Well, I'll tell you the story from the beginning. One night, it was on the 20th of May in 1888, to be exact, I was returning home from a visit to a patient when my steps led me through Baker Street. Since my marriage, I haven't seen much of Sherlock Holmes. And and you couldn't resist stopping by at 221B, I'm sure, Doctor. (laughs) Of course I couldn't. As I stood outside the well-remembered door, I looked up at the lighted windows and saw the tall, spare figure of my old friend passed twice in dark silhouette against the blind. He was pacing the room swiftly, eagerly, with his head sunk on his chest and his hands clasped behind him. To me, who knew every mood of his and habit of his, his attitude and manner told their own story. He was hot on the scent of some new problem. I rang the bell, and a few moments later, found myself standing before him. You look in splendid shape. Yes, Holmes, I'm feeling very well, thanks. And in practice again, I see. You didn't tell me that you'd gone back into harness. Oh, and how did you know? Elementary, my dear chap. If a gentleman walks into my rooms smelling of iodoform with uh, a black mark of nitrate of silver on his right forefinger and a bulge on the left side of his hat to show where he's uh, secreted his stethoscope, I should be dull indeed if I didn't pronounce him to be an active member of the medical profession. Uh, just the same as ever, Holmes. By the way, I'm... Uh... Not interrupting you, are well, you? are, old fellow, but it's, um, it's a most welcome interruption. You're working on a new case? Um, it looks like it. This letter arrived by the last post today. It's undated and has neither signature nor address. Read it. Oh, so look. There will call upon you tonight at a quarter to eight o'clock a gentleman who desires to consult you upon a matter of the very deepest moment. Your recent services to one of the royal houses of Europe have shown that you are one who may safely be trusted. This account of you we have from all quarters received. (laughs) Uh, Be in your chamber, then, at that hour, and do not take it amiss if your visitor wears a mask. It's it's all very mysterious. What do you imagine it means? Look carefully at the note, old fellow. What do you deduce from it? Oh, now, let me think. The man who wrote it was presumably well-to-do. Such paper couldn't be bought under half a crown a packet. And it's peculiarly strong and and stiff. Peculiar. That's the very word. It's not an English paper at all. Hold it up to the light. Don't you notice anything? Yes. There's a large E with a small G and and a large G with a small T. That's right. Woven into the texture of the paper. What does that suggest to you? The name of the maker, no doubt, or perhaps his monogram. Not at all, my dear fellow. The G with the small T stands for Gesellschaft which is the German for company. And the E.G.? That stands for Igria. It's a German-speaking country in Bohemia, not far from Carlsbad. Oh, so the paper was made in Bohemia. Undoubtedly, my dear fellow. And the man who wrote the note is a German. How do you know that? Observe the curious construction of the sentence, This account of you we have from all quarters received. A Frenchman or a Russian could not have written that. It's the German who is so discourteous to his verbs. Oh, there's your clown now. I, I, I better go home. No, 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 unless you have to. Well, I, I could stay. I thought that perhaps Then stay, you... old chap. I'm lost without my Boswell, and this promises to be interesting. I, um, I told Mrs. Hudson to let the masked visitor come upstairs unannounced. Come in. Good evening, sir. You, uh... You received my note? Yes, indeed, sir. Come in, won't you, and sit down. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. You may say anything before him that you can say to me. Whom have I the honor to address? You may address me as uh, Count von Kram. How do you do, sir? You must excuse this mask that I wear. Uh, The august person who employs me wishes his agent to be unknown to you, and uh, I may confess at once that the title by which I have just called myself is not exactly my own. I'm well aware of that fact, sir. You see, uh, Mr. Holmes, uh, the matter I am about to discuss uh, implicates the great house of Ormstein, hereditary kings of uh, Bohemia. That has not escaped me either, sir. In fact, if you will state your case, I shall be the better able to advise you. 
Your Majesty. Uh, how did you... Yes. Yes, I am the king. Why should I attempt to conceal it? Why, indeed. I shall remove the mask. There. Mr. Holmes, I have traveled incognito from Prague for the express purpose of consulting you. Then pray consult. Briefly, the facts are these. Some five years ago, uh, during a visit to Warsaw, I made the acquaintance of the well-known adventuress Irene Adler. Irene Adler? We know of her, Your Majesty. Uh, look her up in the index for me, will you, Watson? Uh, it's right beside you on the desk there. I uh, imagined that the name would not be unfamiliar Here to you. Here we are. Hey, Abraham's Acton Green Hatchet Murders. Adler, Adler. Splendid, you splendid, old fellow. Hand me the file, will you? Yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Irene Adler, born in New Jersey in the United States in 1858. Contralto. Mm-hmm. Prima Donna Imperial Opera of Warsaw. Mm-hmm. Retired from the operatic stage, living in London. Quite so. And here's a recent notation. Uh huh. Your Majesty, as I understand, became entangled with this young person, wrote her some compromising letters, and is now desirous of getting those letters back. Precisely so, but how did... Was there a secret marriage? None. No legal papers or certificates? No. Then I feel to follow, Your Majesty. If this young lady should produce her letters for blackmailing purposes, how is she to prove their authenticity? There is the handwriting. Well, that could be a forgery, Your Majesty. But it was private note paper. Stolen. My own seal. Imitated. My photograph. Bought. What? They were bought... In the photograph. Oh, dear, oh, dear. That's very bad. Your Majesty has indeed committed an indiscretion. Uh, did you inscribe the photograph, Your Majesty? Uh, yes, Dr. Watson. I'm afraid I did. Oh, uh, Mr. Holmes, it must be recovered. Perhaps if you were to pay enough, the photograph might be bought. She refuses to sell. Oh, stolen, then. Uh, five attempts have been made. Twice burglars in my pay ransacked our house. Once we diverted her luggage when she traveled. Twice she has been waylaid. There has been no result. Oh, dear. It's quite a pretty little problem. Uh, it is a deadly serious one to me. Your Majesty, what does Miss Adler intend to do with the photograph? To ruin me. Oh, how? Well, I, uh, I'm about to be married to the second daughter of the King of Scandinavia. She is the soul of delicacy. A shadow of a doubt as to my conduct would bring the matter to an end. Mm. And Irene Adler threatens to send the photograph to your fiancée, I suppose. Yes, and she will do it. Rather than let me marry another woman, there are no lengths to which she would not go. Are None. you sure that she's not already sent it, Your Majesty? I am sure. Now, why, Your Majesty? She said uh, that she would send it on the day my betrothal is publicly announced. That day will be next Monday. Splendid. Then we have still um, three days yet. Uh, your Majesty will, of course, stay in London for the present. Certainly. You will find me at the Langham Hotel, registered as uh, Count von Kram. Just two questions before you leave, sir. What are they? Is the photograph large or small? Quite large. And uh, it was in a heavy frame. I see. And what is Miss Irene Adler's London address? Brioni Lodge, Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Uh, thank you, Your Majesty. Good night, and I trust we shall soon have some good news for you. I am placing all my hopes in you, Mr. Holmes. Good night. Good night, Dr. Watson. Uh, good night, Your Majesty. Fascinating problem, Holmes. I, I wish I could help you with it. You can, my dear chap. Huh? I shall be glad of your company. Oh, splendid. Uh, what's our first move, Holmes? Well, a good night's rest, I think. We'll meet here at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And then? And then, my dear fellow, we will see what we can find out about Miss Irene Adler. Late of the Warsaw Imperial Opera Company and at present residing at Bryony Lodge... Serpentine Avenue, St. John's Wood. Well, Holmes, a cursory examination of Brownie Lodge didn't prove very illuminating. No, a bijou residence that represents the essence of dignified suburbia, but tells us very little about its owner. I think a visit to the local public house might prove more instructive. Come on, old chap. I see the door to the coach and horses inviting us from across the road. Well, our disguises shouldn't cause any suspicion, Holmes. That's why I suggested them. In the character of a couple of stable hands, I felt that we might inspire confidence. This is a horsey neighborhood. There's a wonderful sympathy and Freemasonry among the fraternity. There we are. 
Better let me do most of the talking. Yes, I will indeed. I'm sure that your accent will be more convincing than mine. Let's go in, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> What'll it be, Mages? Half a bowl of malt, please. Uh, how about you, Charlie? All ever say? Yeah. Two halves of olden mild. <laughs> well, here you are, Mages. That'll be a tenner. Uh, have a drink with us, Governor. Oh, don't mind if I do. <laughs> I'll have a Guinness. You, uh, blokes new round here? Yes, that's right. Come over from Clapham. Clapham, eh? Uh, <laughs> well, here's looking at you. Ah. <clears throat> Hunting for jobs? That's right. Uh, we was told that Miss Idler across the Briony Lodge needed a new coachman and a groom. Well, it's the first time I've heard of it. Might be true. Uh, have you been over there to ask? No, not yet. We thought we'd find out something about the old girl first. <laughs> she ain't no old girl, matey. <laughs> She's the prettiest young thing you ever saw under a bonnet, and that's a fact. You know her, Governor? Why, of course I know her. Used to drive her carriage, I did. Uh, uh, for I uh, can't work here. Oh, what's she like? Oh, nice little lady, as you'll find, Jim. A work yard? No, no, no. She, uh, she lives quiet, like... Uh, goes out uh, singing at concerts once in a while. The rest of the time, it's money for Jim. She goes out for a drive in the park every day at five and comes back to dinner at 6.30. Uh, the rest of the time's your own. She ain't married, you say? No, no. But uh, she's got a bloke what comes to see her all the time. Uh, he's a barrister. Nice gentleman. Uh, Mr. Geoffrey Norton is his name. Good-looking fella. Uh, wouldn't be surprised to see him get spliced. <laughs> Sounds like a cushy job to me. Come on, Charlie. Let's get over to the house and see what's what. Much obliged to you, chum. Well, <laughs> good luck, mateys, and, good luck, mate. and, and thanks for the goodies. <laughs> What's our next move, Holmes? Let's stroll back to Briony Lodge. I'm undecided whether to continue my investigation there or to try and find out something about Mr. Geoffrey Norton, the barrister. If he's just her lawyer and nothing else, it's more than likely that she's entrusted the photograph to his safekeeping. Uh, hello. There's a cab waiting outside Miss Adler's house. Hurry, Watson. Maybe Mr. Norton's. Here, here we are at the gate. Yes. Here comes a man hurrying down the pathway. Quick. Flatten yourself behind this post. Listen. Where to now, Mr. Norton? Drive like the devil. First to Gross and Hankies in Regent Street, and then to the Church of St. Monica in the Edgeware Road. Half a sovereign if you do it in 20 minutes. Right, Charles, Mr. Norton. Up in. Fire and signal the cab, Watson. We must follow him. Well, here comes one. Oh, no, it isn't. It's, it's a private carriage. It's heartless, no doubt. Here she comes down the pathway. Back behind the post again, Watson. Where to, Miss Adler? The Church of St. Monica's, John. And half a sovereign if you reach it in 20 minutes. The game's afoot, Watson. Quick. We must get a cab and follow them. Well, here comes a hansom. Hi, cabby, cabby. Here. You blokes got enough money to take a cab? Here's a half sovereign for you, my man. Right you are. Where to, Governor? The Church of St. Monica. In the Edgeware Road. And another half sovereign for you if you get us there in 20 minutes. <laughs> Doctor, once again, you broke off your story at the most exciting point. Did uh, you and Sherlock Holmes reach that church inside the 20 minutes? Yes, Mr. Bartell, we did, but the other carriages were there before us. Holmes went into the church after telling me to guard the outside. I must have waited for 10 minutes or more before Mr. Geoffrey Norton and Miss Adler came out, spoke a few words to each other, and then left in their separate conveyances. A moment later, Holmes, still dressed as a stable hand, came striding out of the church and down the steps towards me. He was obviously very excited. Watson! Watson! Have they left? Yes, in separate cabs. I overheard him say that he was going back to his office. And she said, I shall drive out in the park and, at five as, this evening. Splendid, old fellow. And come on, we can return to Baker Street. Uh, what happened inside the church? Home? They were married. Married? Of course. The ceremony would have been illegal if it had been performed after noon. That accounted for their wild dash to the church. Jump into the cab. Where to now, Governor? 221B Baker Street. 
Oh, so they they got married, eh? Yes, and it may amuse you to know that I acted as witness at the ceremony. Oh, you did? But how did that happen? Their, their own witness had failed to appear and I was dragged into the breach. The uh, bride gave me the sovereign as a memento. I uh, think I'll wear it on my watch chain in memory of the occasion. What an amazing situation. Things begin to look better for the king, don't they? Yes. Now that she's Mrs. Norton, the chances are that she won't want to expose his majesty after all. I hope so, Watson. I hope so. But we can't afford to take any chances. I think the time is right for us to come to closer grip with the lady. Well, Holmes, now that we've eaten, perhaps you'll tell me your plan. With pleasure, my dear fellow. And while I'm so doing, I'll proceed with applying the makeup for my new disguise. Another disguise? What's it to be this time? I think the character and appearance of an amiable and simple-minded nonconformist clergyman would be most suited to my plan for entering Miss Adler's house. Are you going to try and enter, then? I must, dear fellow. Yes, huh? I'm sure the photograph is there. Miss Adler, or rather Mrs. Norton, will return from her drive in the park at 6.30. We must be at Briony Lodge to meet her. And what then? You must leave that to me. I've already made my arrangements. There is only one point on which I must insist. You must not interfere, come what may. You understand? I'm to remain neutral. Yes, there will be some small unpleasantness. Don't join in it. It will end in my being conveyed into the house. As soon as I'm able to, I shall open one of the windows. You are to watch from the outside. When I raise my hand, you will throw an object which I shall give you through the window and at the same time cry, Fire! Follow me? Entirely, but what am I to throw? Oh, it's nothing very formidable. Well, here it is. Huh. Looks like a great big cigar. What is it? Just an ordinary plumber's smoke rocket, fitted with a cap at each end to make it self-lighting. Your task is confined to throwing it through the window. When you raise the cry, fire, it will be taken up by quite a number of people. We then walk to the end of the street, and I'll rejoin you in ten minutes. I hope I've made myself clear. Perfectly. Good. And now, old fellow, as soon as I've done my clerical attire, let's be on our way. There's no time to be lost. <laughs> Nearly 6.30, Holmes. We've been pacing up and down in front of her house for half an hour now. I hope she does come back. I'm sure she will. There seem to be a lot of loafers hanging around her gate. All part of my conspiracy, old chap. You'll see them play their parts in a few minutes. You still think the photograph is inside the house? Yes, I'm sure of it. Hmm? It's most unlikely that she carries it about with her. Remember, the king told us it was a, a large frame picture. And also remember that she planned to use it within a few days. It must be where she can lay her hands on it. It must be inside her house. But her house has been burgled twice. Oh, they don't know how to look. Well, how will you look? I won't. I'll get her to show me. She'll refuse. Well, she won't be able to... Shh. Here comes the carriage now. Remember, Watson, carry out my orders to the letter. Yes, you can trust me. Huh? Good night. Blimey, here comes the Duchess of Tillowakes. Let's put out the carpet. She might get her tootsies wet. Oh, put her sock in it, Elfie. Leave him alone. She's no better than she ought to be. Please let me through. I live here. Well, ain't that nice? We'll all come in and have a cup of cocoa. <laughs> Move out of the way, please, and let the lady through. Mind your own business. Just because your collar's turned the wrong way, you can't spoil our fun. That's right, Eddie. Keep your nose out of it, Parson. Please, please. Don't fight about it. I tell you to stop molesting the lady. Do ya? Then how would you like a biff in the nose? <laughs> oh, he hit the poor man. Then he ran away, the coward. Is the clergyman badly hurt? He hit his head, Mum, and he fell. If you ask me, he's hurt bad. He's bleeding something terrible. Can we bring him in, Mum? He can't lie here in the street. Why, of course. Bring him in. Right you are, Mum. Here, Bert. Right out. Give us a hand. Uh, be way. Oh, poor fella. Do you see what happened to him, mister? Yes, I saw my good woman. A very convincing demonstration. What you mean? Uh, weren't you paid by a, a certain gentleman for this performance? Oh, Yen knows about it too. Yeah, you must be a friend of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Yes, um, I am. Nice gentleman. He give us five bob a piece for tonight's work. It ain't through yet, though. We got to start yelling fire when somebody tells us. I'm that somebody, my dear lady. There's Mr. Holmes now. He's inside the house. Yes, he's opening a window. Now he's raising his hand. That's my signal. Now to throw the rocket. Uh, there we are. Ah! Ah! Holmes, there you are. 
You have the photograph? No. But I know where it is. She showed me as I told you she would. I'm still in the dark. There's no mystery, old chap. When my accomplices started the row in the street, I had a little moist red paint in my hand. As my good friend Alfie pretended to strike me, I clapped my hand to my head and fell down. It's an old trick. Yes, I understand that, but uh, how did my throwing the rocket help you? It was all important, my dear fellow. When a woman thinks her home is on fire, her instinct is at once to rush to the thing she values most. A married woman grabs her baby. An unmarried reaches for her jewel box. In this case, of course, it was the photograph. Well, where was it? In a recess in the living room, just above the right-hand bell pole. I caught a glimpse of it as she half drew it out. When I made it known that the fire was a false alarm, she replaced the photograph. As soon as I was able, I assured her that I was feeling well enough to leave. You didn't take the photograph, then? No, I felt that uh, over-precipitance at this stage might ruin everything. And what do we do now? Drive to the Langham Hotel and inform His Majesty of what has happened. Then return with him here. After that, my dear chap, the case will be ended. <laughs> This is Barney Lodge now, Your Majesty. Yes, I'm all impatience. Your certain this photograph will still be there, Mr. Holmes. I have every reason to believe so, Your Majesty. Mm, I, I must confess, uh, this is going to be something of an ordeal. And I suggest that you let me do the talking, Your Majesty. I think I know how to handle the lady. Sherlock Holmes, I believe. Uh, yes. I am Mr. Holmes. How did you know? My mistress told me that you would be likely to call. She has left for the continent with her husband. You mean she's left England? Never to return. Uh, uh, then the papers and the photograph. Uh, all is lost, Mr. Holmes. We'll soon see. Follow me. She said you'd be looking for something. I hope you find it. This was the bell, Paul. There's a sliding panel behind it somewhere. Ah, here it is. Uh, is, uh, is the photograph there, Mr. Holmes? There is a photograph, but it's a photograph of the lady alone. Uh, here's a letter, and it's addressed to me. Well, what's it say, Holmes? My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, you really did it very well. Until after the fire alarm, I had no suspicion. But then, when I realized how I had betrayed myself, I began to think... I've been warned that if the king employed an agent, it would certainly be you. May I congratulate you on your disguise as the dear old clergyman? Right, Scott. You were far more clever than you thought, Holmes. Uh, yeah, yeah, go on. What else does it say? Uh, let me see. My husband and I both thought that the best recourse was flight. So you will find the nest empty. As to the photograph of the king and yourself, his majesty may rest in peace. Thank goodness for that. I love and am loved by a better man than he. Hmm. I leave another photograph, however, that he might care to possess. And I remain, dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, very truly yours, Irene Norton, nay Adler. What a woman, Watson. What a woman. What a magnificent woman. She fooled me completely. But, uh, oh, I... I'm sorry, Your Majesty. I, I've been unable to bring your business to a more successful conclusion. On uh, the contrary, my dear sir... Nothing could be more successful. I know that Irene's word is inviolate. The incriminating photograph is now as safe as if it were in the fire. I'm glad to hear your majesty say so. I am immensely indebted to you. Now, pray tell me in, in what way I can reward you. This uh, bell uh, ring that I wear, <laughs> I should be proud uh, Your majesty to... has something that I should um, value even more highly. You have but to name it. This photograph. Irene's photograph? But certainly. However, you must let me give you something more substantial. Oh, no, 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 Your Majesty. This is uh, something I shall treasure all my life. This and a golden sovereign I received from the lady's hand. They will remind me that I was once tricked by a woman. A woman that I shall never forget. <laughs> What a woman, that Mrs. Adler. Or should I say, Mrs. Norton. Ah, that's the kind of woman I could really go for, Doctor. Yes, I believe you could. Just between ourselves, you know, I sort of, uh, well, uh, 
I sort of could go, go for her myself. <laughs> she was intelligent. Yeah, she was rich. Beautiful. That's the kind of woman you want sitting next to you in front of a cozy fire on a nippy fall night. Just the three of you. The three of you? Mm-hmm. You, she, and a glass of Petri Port. Miss <laughs> Portelli. <laughs> Why not? That Petri California Port is some wine. Boy, that Petri family really knows how to make good wine, all right. And no wonder. Look at all the experience they've had. Ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s, the Petri family has handed down from father to son, from father to son, the art of selecting perfect sun-ripened California grapes and making them into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. Those letters, P-E-T-R-I, on the label of every bottle of Petri wine are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. It's got to be, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, that was a great story you told us tonight. I thought you'd like it, Mr. Bartell. That's why I plan to tell you a a sequel to it next week. A sequel? Say, that sounds exciting, Doctor. Oh, I think you'll find that it proves to be that, Mr. Bartell. It's a story that takes place 20 years after tonight's adventure. And once again, the principal part is played by a woman. Only in this case, it isn't Irene Adler. It's her daughter. Oh, uh, and now, Mr. Bartell, before I go, I... I want to remind our listeners that they owe a real debt of gratitude to the selective service boards in their communities. At this moment, those selective service boards are working harder than ever, making sure that every returning veteran knows his rights and privileges. And the boards are helping him take full advantage of those rights and privileges. And they're helping our veterans get jobs. Our selective service boards deserve our sincere thanks, and they deserve our cooperation. They have done, and they are doing, a splendid job. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is an adaptation of the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend... That master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And now for our weekly visit with the good Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Oh, no, no, don't get up. You you look much too comfortable. (laughs) Take off your overcoat and, and come and join me. Well, I enjoyed your story of a scandal in Bohemia last week, Doctor, and tonight you promised us a sequel. Yes, that's right, Mr. Bartell. A sequel that took place... Over 20 years afterwards, in 1909 to be exact, Sherlock Holmes was living on his Sussex bee farm. It was only in June, I remember, that I received a telegram from the great man asking me to come and spend a long weekend with him. And I'm sure you needed no urging to accept the invitation. (laughs) None, Mr. Bartell, none at all. I hadn't seen Holmes for some time, and this fact, combined with my rather indifferent health, 
found me on the Eastbourne train a few hours after receiving the telegram. A dog cart was at the station to meet me, and after a brisk drive across the downs, I found myself once more with my good friend. He looked somewhat older than when I'd last seen him, but as he spoke to me, I realized from the keenness of his voice and the sparkle in his eye that Sherlock Holmes would never really be old. After a while, our conversation lapsed into the comfortable silence that can, 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 pardon me, exist only between friends. And then, as the sun was setting, Holmes picked up his beloved violin and began to play some haunting melody. As he lay back, eyes half closed, his long, thin fingers caressing the instrument, a wave of nostalgia swept over me. I thought of the many years that, that we'd spent together and of the exciting adventures that we had shared during the old days in Baker Street. Beautiful. Quite beautiful. Thank you, Watson. <clears throat> you look uncommonly wistful, dear chap. You were thinking of the old days? Yes, Holmes. I was. So was I. Uh-huh. Oh, well. Those were exciting times, but it's comforting to think that now we will not be disturbed by a jangling doorbell followed shortly by some poor devil in trouble. Nowadays, my greatest excitements are connected with the segregation of the Queen Bee and the nighttime proclivities of Charles Augustus, my tomcat. <laughs> I still find it hard to think of you in retirement, Holmes. Do you ever consider returning to active practice? Oh, I consider it occasionally and then reject the idea. A man should work only up to the peak of his ability. I'm past mine. Nonsense, Holmes. You're just as alert as ever you were. Mentally, perhaps, but not physically. Would, uh... Would you consider handling a small problem <clears throat> in, uh, in England? Oh, if it's a personal problem that affects you, my dear chap, you know I'll do anything I can. Well, it's not exactly my problem, Holmes, but there was a charming uh, young girl on the train. We, we got into conversation and... Uh, <laughs> you don't age at any rate, old chap. You're just as susceptible as ever. No, 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 Holmes, let me finish. She said that you knew her mother quite well. Her mother? Come in. Oh, yes, Devers, what is it? I'm sorry to disturb you, Mr. Holmes. Your man said I might come in. Uh, my master, Mr. Little Stanley, instructed me to deliver this note. Oh, thank you. He uh, also instructed me to wait for a reply. What confounded impudence. You can tell your master that there's no answer to this letter. But he told me I must get a reply. You may tell Mr. Lytton Stanley that I will instruct my solicitors to reply to his message in due course. Oh, but, sir... That's all, Devers. You may go. Very good, sir. What did the note say, Holmes? Hmm. Read it for yourself. Keep your filthy bees where they belong. One of my guests was stung yesterday. If this happens again, I'll have the police run you out of this place. Good Lord, what an offensive letter. The man himself is even more offensive. He's a retired manufacturer who thinks that his immense wealth entitles him to domineer over the local residents. Oh, but let's not spoil a nice sunny afternoon by discussing him. Please continue with the story of the young lady that you met on the train. Yes, I'd like to. Poor little thing seems in dreadful trouble. I, I do wish you would help her. You say that she told you uh, her mother knew me? Yes. What's her name? Norton. I really Norton. Norton? I don't seem to recall it. Oh, but of course. Where is the girl, Watson? She's staying at the Red Lion in the village. Then ring her on the telephone and ask her to come over here as fast as she can. Of course I'll help her. I'm delighted, Holmes, but... Uh... What made you change your mind so suddenly? Uh, is your memory so short that you can't remember Irene Adler? Surely you haven't forgotten that in the case you called a scandal in Bohemia, I was completely fooled by her? I do, yes, 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 of course. You always refer to her as the woman. But how does Irene Norton fit into the picture? Irene Adler married a barrister named Geoffrey Norton. Tell Miss Norton to come at once, Watson. She is the daughter of the woman. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, I've heard so much about you from Mother. She says you're the cleverest man in England. <laughs> Your mother flatters me, my dear child. She herself was much more clever than I. In fact, it... Oh, uh, yes. 
<laughs> did she ever tell you about the, uh, the circumstances under which we met? No, Mr. Holmes, though she did tell me that you were a witness when she and my father were married. <laughs> very true, my dear, very true. Though the occasion was a little, uh, well, shall we say unusual? Look here. This uh, golden sovereign I wear on my watch chain is a memento of that day. I also have a charming photograph of your mother. You must have known her quite well. <clears throat> how, how about telling Mr. Holmes about your troubles, my nephew? Yes. <laughs> Reminiscences are charming, but they can wait until we've dealt with your problems. Mr. Holmes, I'm being blackmailed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. Uh, by whom? By a neighbor of yours, Mr. Lytton Stanley. Do you know him? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed I do. As a matter of fact, Mr. Holmes received a most offensive note from the gentleman less than an hour ago. Uh, what hold does Mr. Stanley have over you, my dear? He has some letters, some rather indiscreet letters of mine that I wrote to a friend of his last year. How did he obtain these letters, Miss Norton? He must have stolen them. I don't know how, but when I was staying at his house a few weeks ago, he told me that he had them and asked 5,000 pounds for their return. Oh, gracious me. And um, why should he consider your letters, even indiscreet letters... Worth so large a sum. <laughs> I'm engaged to be married to Lord Weston's son. That awful man, Lytton Stanley, knows that if my fiancé saw the letters, the marriage would never take place. They must be extremely compromising. Oh, they aren't, really. But I was much younger when I wrote them. In fact, I was only 17, and I'm afraid they could easily be misconstrued. Have you told your mother? Oh, no, she'd never understand. Hmm. She might surprise you on that score, I think. <laughs> How about your father? Daddy's a barrister. You can imagine how straight-laced he'd be about the whole thing. That's why I came to you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I see. You, uh, you feel that I am not so, uh, well, should we say, straight-laced? No, of course you aren't. Mother's told me about you, and in any case, I've read Dr. Watson's stories. Watson, my dear fellow? Your stories will land me in serious trouble one of these days. Uh, what are you suggesting Mr. Holmes can do for you, Miss Norton? Get the letters back for me. <laughs> but how? Steal them, of course. Well, really, my dear, I hardly think you... No, 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 my dear Watson, don't be shocked. Oh, Miss I... Norton is a forthright girl like her mother before her. It's most refreshing. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, you can't say you won't help me. No, I don't think that I can say it. In any case, I have a slight personal score to settle with Mr. Lytton Stanley myself. He's rude and has no understanding of bees. But how are you going to steal the letters? That problem requires a little thought, old chap. I can tell you how to do it, Mr. Holmes. Oh, really? This is delightful, my dear. You've explained the problem and also the way of solving it. How easy a detective's work might be if all clients were equally helpful. Tell me, what is your plan? Tomorrow is a servant's half day off at Mr. Lytton Stanley's. He'll be alone there during the afternoon. How do you know that fact? My maid was keeping company, as they say, with Divas the butler when I was staying there a few weeks ago. She found out everything from him. My letters are kept in a filigree box in his desk. With your enterprise, my dear, I'm surprised that you didn't try and open the desk yourself. I did. But it's very sturdy and has a combination lock. Oh. However, I'm sure that you and Dr. Watson can think of some way of getting the letters, particularly if Mr. Lytton Stanley's alone in the house. Uh, we shall do our best, Miss Norton. Promise me one thing, though, both of you. Oh, what's that? Don't read the letters, will you? I, I, I'm really rather ashamed of writing them. Oh, of course we won't, my dear child. You're both so sweet to me. How can I thank you? <laughs> Thanks would be a little premature, but um, you could do us a favor. Of course. What is it? Your mother had a beautiful voice, I recall. I, uh, I wonder if you inherit her talent. I do sing, though I've never done so professionally, like mother. And I've never played the violin professionally, but perhaps uh, between us we could give Watson a little concert? That's a delightful idea. We can't do anything until tomorrow anyway. Uh, what would you like to sing? <laughs> Songs my mother taught ah, me. Really, really, remarkably appropriate. In the days long vanished, seldom from her. Charming. Tonight, music, and tomorrow. A touch of daylight robbery. Dear old Watson, your disguise is really excellent. Oh, I must confess I'm a little apprehensive. Hi, old chap. There's no need to be, I assure you. You, as Dr. Hamish, and I, as the Reverend Appleby, are calling on Mr. Lytton Stanley, ostensibly in search of a contribution for my charity hospital that you are in charge of. 
What could be simpler? Well, what made you decide on the, on the role of a clergyman? It should simplify our entrance into the house. Now, hmm? I must confess that a rare touch of sentiment prompted the choice of my disguise. Oh, how does sentiment enter into it? Oh, surely you remember that it was in the role of a simple-minded nonconformist clergyman that I once attempted to deceive Miss Norton's mother? That's right. <laughs> yes, I'd forgotten. That woman really fascinates you, doesn't yeah, she? she does, old chap. <laughs> Irene Adler was uh, one woman I've always regarded with unbounded admiration, even though she was a criminal. But the matter of this, come on, old fellow. Are you ready? Yes. You have the equipment I mentioned to you? In my pocket? And let's be off, old chap. Let's be off. <laughs> Oh, Mother Devil, doesn't he answer the door? Come, 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 my dear Reverend Appleby, for a parson, your language is, is hardly appropriate. I'm sorry, Dr. Hamish. Shh, shh. Here comes someone. Yes? Miss Tedderton Stanley. That's my name. And mine is Appleby, and this is my friend, Dr. Hamish. I'm proud to meet you, sir. I've heard a great deal about you. What can I do for you? If we could come in for a moment, I'll explain our mission. Oh, uh, very well. Come into the study. We are raising a subscription list for a charity hospital at Paddlewake, just across the Downs. You're a prominent resident here, and we thought that you'd like to donate a few guineas. I'm really not very interested. I've given as much to charity this year as I can afford. Well, it's a fine call, sir. I'm giving my medical services three days a week, and the Reverend Appleby is donating his services too. Who else has contributed to this fund? All your neighbors, sir. We just came from the bee farm over the downs. The owner, Mr. Holmes, gave us a check for five guineas. Mm. Holmes gave you five guineas, did he? Aye, a very nice gentleman, Mr. Holmes. We're proposing to name a ward in the hospital after him. Is this list of subscribers going to be published in the paper? Oh, yes, oh, yes, Mr. Litton Stanley. I'll give you ten guineas. Ten oh, guineas? Thank That's you, sir. Very thank kind you. of you, sir, I'm sure. Aye, I'll uh, get my checkbook. It's in this desk. Quick, Watson. The chloroform. Right. Now, uh, uh, who do I make this check payable to? Go on, there. Go on, still, Holmes. Hold him still. Very neat, Watson. Chloroform doesn't take long, does it? Little, little, little old fellow. He's lying over the desk. That's it. Is the filigree box in there? Uh-huh. Here it is. Splendid. Holmes, don't open it. You promised that you wouldn't. I just wish to make sure that... Make sure uh, of who what the... was there, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Who, who the... Oh, no, don't move. I have a revolver, and don't turn round. Place the box on the table, Mr. Holmes. And put your hands up, gentlemen, both of you. That's right. I know that voice. It's Devers, the butler. Uh, quite correct, sir. Well, Devers, you needn't point a revolver at us. Your, your master isn't injured. I'm not in the least interested in my master's health, Dr. Watson. In fact... If he were dead, I should be delighted. And what are you up to, Devers? I'm taking advantage of a situation, sir. I've been trying to open that desk for weeks. After such kindness on your part, sir, I hate to seem ungracious, but I'm dreadfully afraid I shall have to kill you, uh, to kill both of you. Doctor, that was a fine place to break off your story with the butler pointing a gun at your backs and you and Sherlock Holmes with your hands above your heads. What happened next? I know at least you didn't get killed. You wouldn't be sitting here in California tonight telling me the story. Elementary, my dear Mr. Bartell, <laughs> but supposing I take you back in the story to the point where I left off. Well, all right then. Take me back, Doctor. Take me back. Very well. We stood there, Holmes and I, our hands above our heads. As Devers said... Well, I am that you opened the desk for me. After such kindness on your part, sir, I hate to seem ungracious, but I'm dreadfully afraid I'm going to have to kill you both. Adivas, I dislike to appear stupid at such a melodramatic moment, but why is it necessary to kill us? Uh, for months, I have been waiting for an opportunity to steal the Kitmanjar emerald, and now you have done it for me, sir. And presented me with a perfect alibi. The Kitmanjar emerald? Oh, come now, Mr. Holmes. You know the treasures in this house as well as I do. Apart from the emerald, there's a superb Cellini that would fetch a fine price in the right market. We aren't here after any valuables, my good man. Please don't call me your good man, Dr. Watson. It's patronizing and untrue. 
In any case, sir, whether you were here after the valuables or not makes no difference. I've caught you both red-handed. You're completely in my power, gentlemen. You're going to steal the treasures, I suppose, and then pretend that we were responsible. Exactly, sir. Mm -hmm. I shall kill you both, secrete what objects appeal to me, and when my master regains consciousness, I shall explain that I found three men burgling the house, that I killed two of them while the third got away with the loot. Who will be able to doubt my word? I shall be regarded as a hero. <laughs> I might even have my salary raised. Uh, Watson, I'm afraid this is the end, old chap. What a sordid way to die. Shot the back like a coward. Adibas, at least do us the courtesy of allowing us to face the firing squad, will you? Very well, gentlemen. Turn round. But don't try any tricks. One last request. Uh, what is it, sir? I'm beaten, and I admit it. I'm getting old, but in my heyday, I've crossed swords with some of the greatest criminals in Europe. My life has been attempted many times, but I've always escaped. If this is to be my swan song, at least give me the privilege of shaking the hand of a man who has at last bested me. Well, sir, I feel that I'm stepping a little out of my station, but I suppose the situation is unusual. I hope you don't object to the left hand, sir. I'll keep the revolver in my right. Very well, Devers. There you are. Goodbye, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, Devers, and my congratulations for... My congratulations for being a fool. Well done, Holmes. Maybe getting old, Watson, but I've not lost my skill at Barrett, too. Oh, he went over your shoulder in a flash. Fortunately, the bullet went wide. How is he, Watson? Struck the desk as he fell. Yes, he's gashed his head. It's not serious. He'll be unconscious for a while. Good, but I think we'll take the precaution of closing this desk drawer. I don't want him to be exposed to further temptation when he comes to. Here we are. Well, shouldn't we get into touch with the police, Holmes? The police? Great Scott, no, old fellow. After all, we're burglars and we're in disguise. Two facts that would be hard to explain satisfactorily. No, Watson, we must get back to the bee farm as soon as possible. Yes, I suppose you're right. Miss Norton will be waiting for us there and we'll tell her what's happened. Poor girl, I'm afraid she's in for something of a shock. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I'm so glad to see you back again. Did you get the filigree box? Yes, Miss Norton, here it is. But, Holmes, I didn't know that you... Miss Watson, uh, why not open it, Miss Norton? Well, I... I uh... Open it, my dear. There may not be love letters inside it, but there's a note. Oh. Why don't you read it to us? Well, uh, let this be a warning, Miss Norton. Crime does not pay. If you don't believe me, ask your mother. Sincerely, Sherlock Holmes... Mr. Holmes, you knew my secret all the time. Not all the time, but I realized it as soon as I'd opened the filigree box. What on earth are you talking about? Miss Norton was under the impression that she could use me as a cat's paw, as a dupe to commit a burglary for her. I still don't understand, Holmes. You will remember she asked us to promise not to open the box. Yes, but you did, sir, just before the fellow held us up with a revolver. What was inside the box? An impressive green stone which I knew to be the Kitmanjar Emerald. But where is the emerald now? I slipped it back into Mr. Lytton Stanley's desk and locked it. Brought the box here because I wanted to see your expression, Miss Norton, as you opened it. Great, Scott, and I thought you were a poor little thing in trouble. Shocking. What do you have to say for yourself, young lady? That I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Holmes, terribly sorry. It seemed like a wildly exciting idea, but... I didn't really mean to steal it. Oh, of course not. No, no, of course you didn't. You meant me to steal it for you. Miss Norton, I'm convinced you knew that your mother once outwitted me and you presumed to think that you could do the same. I should turn you over to the police. Please don't, Mr. Holmes. You can't do that. I certainly could. But I'm not going to for two reasons. First, you're young and impressionable, and this may teach you a lesson. And in the second place, I have a strange admiration for your mother. But I warn you, Miss Norton, that you have had a narrow escape. A very narrow escape. Mr. Holmes, before I go, there's one favor I want to ask oh, you. Really? What is it? Could I keep this filigree box with your note inside it? It would be a reminder all my life of how we met. Ah, what do you say, Watson? Well, it isn't your box to give, Holmes. That's true, old fellow, that's quite true. But I fail to see how we can return it now without disclosing our own share in the attempted robbery. In any case, I don't like Mr. Lytton Stanley. I think we might indulge in a little petty larceny without uh, feeling too guilty. Very well, Miss Norton. You may keep the box. I shall always treasure it. Thank you. Goodbye, Dr. Watson. Don't think too badly of me. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. You know, Holmes. 
Holmes, I must say you were surprisingly lenient with that girl. Do you suppose her mother put her up to the whole thing? That possibility had occurred to me, old fellow. And yet I have a feeling that... Come in. Doors open. Were you expecting anyone? No. Great Scott, it's Lytton Stanley. Good evening, sir. This is an unexpected honor. Sherlock Holmes, we haven't been the best of friends, I know. But you've got to help me now. I'm in serious trouble. Oh, indeed, sir. Won't you sit down? This is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do, How do, do you do? And now, sir, what is your trouble? I've been robbed, Holmes. Robbed? What was stolen? Well, my greatest treasure, the Kitman Jar Emerald, was removed from his case and then mysteriously returned loose in my desk afterwards. But there's a priceless Cellini missing. Have you, uh... Have you any idea who the burglars might be? Oh, it was a gang, I'm sure of that. A couple of disguises, a clergyman and a doctor came into the house on the pretext of raising money for some hospital. And they overpowered me with chloroform. Oh, dear me, dear me. How very unpleasant for you. Yes, well, when I came to, I found my butler, Devers, lying beside me in a pool of blood. The brave fellow had wrestled with the thieves, but they got away. And he's in the hospital now. Holmes, you've got to help me. The Kitman Jar Emerald was returned, you say, but a, a Cellini is missing. Yes. It's an exquisite filigree box in which I'd kept the emerald. A filigree box? Yes, it's a genuine Cellini. It's worth several thousand pounds. Holmes, you must help me solve this business. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Lytton Stanley, but I'm afraid I can't help you. I've retired. <clears throat> yes, and I intend to remain in retirement. <laughs> Good night, sir. Oh, but I'll pay you any fee within reason. My decision is final, sir. Good night. Oh, I might have known I wouldn't get any help from you. Holmes, she fooled you again. Yes, yes, the little devil. She knew that box was a Cellini all the time. You don't seem very angry with her, Holmes. Ah, I should be, but I'm not. What splendid audacity. What a superb nerve the child has. But you must get the box back from her. I shall, Watson. I shall. Or rather, I shall persuade Devers to do it for me. As the price of our silence. But how can he get it back? Remember that he walks out with Miss Norton's maid. I'm certain that when he explains his predicament, he can prevail upon her to steal the box from her mistress so that it may be returned to its rightful owner. That's a good idea. By George Holmes, Miss Norton's a chip off the old pluck, all right. Yes, Watson, <laughs> she is, and it makes me wonder. What about? <laughs> I wonder, my dear chap, how long I can remain in retirement. With such a worthy antagonist at large, it's a challenge. It's an irresistible challenge. You know, Dr. Watson, I just can't get over the way you and Mr. Holmes let that girl, uh, Irene, was that her name, pull the wool over your eyes. Well, she really twisted you around her little finger. Mr. Bartell, I, I don't like to make extremely positive statements, but I'm sure that if you were in my shoes, I really would not only have twisted you around her little finger, but she'd have had you rolling about in hoops and standing on your head. <laughs> you mean she was that beautiful? Mr. Bartell, she was so beautiful that she'd make you forget all about Petri wine. Dr. Watson, no girl is that beautiful. Oh, how young you really are. Well, maybe so, but there are lots of pretty girls in this world and only one Petri wine. That's because there's only one Petri family that's been making wine since the 1800s. And believe me, because the Petri business has always been family-owned and operated, they've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, the highly skilled art of making fine wine. And those generations of winemaking add up to a lot of experience. The Petri family really knows how to turn luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. That's why, no matter what type of wine you wish, you can't go wrong looking for the label that says P-E-T-R-I, Petri, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, now, next week, Mr. Bartell, is the day before Christmas. So I'm going to tell you an adventure that took place many years ago and involved Holmes and myself in one of the most fantastic Christmas Eve situations in which we ever found ourselves. I think you'll like the story. I call it 
The night before Christmas. It sounds swell, Doctor. Oh, thank you. Oh, by the way, before I go, Mr. Bartell, I'd, I'd like to remind our listeners there's no better way to spend money than to spend it on Christmas seals. Every penny spent on Christmas seals not only helps cure tuberculosis, but it also helps prevent it right in your own community. Your purchases of Christmas seals in the past have saved thousands of lives. Keep saving lives. Buy all the Christmas seals you can afford this year. Now, uh, won't you? Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Scandal in Bohemia. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Basil Rathbone's new Columbia record album, Robin Hood, is now available at your music store. Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Oh, say, Doctor, I can see you're going to have yourself quite a Christmas. Big tree in the corner with colored lights on it. Where'd you get those? Table covered with presents? You must be mighty popular. Uh, they aren't all for me, my boy. You see, I'm having a Christmas party tomorrow for my housekeeper's little nieces. Oh. I'm going to dress up as Santa Claus for them. <laughs> well, I'm sure you look very convincing in the part. Oh, by the way, Doctor, I, uh, I brought you a little present. Ooh. Here it is. I hope you'll like it. <laughs> Good you, Mr. Bartola. I got one for you, too, here, Summer. Oh, you... you uh, Mustn't open it until tomorrow. Here, here you are, my boy. Thanks a lot, Doctor. And uh, now, how's about tonight's story? Last week, you told us you'd chosen an adventure with a lot of Christmassy atmosphere. Yes, Mr. Bartell. My story begins on another Christmas Eve many, many years ago. To be exact, in 1886. At the time the adventure occurred, I must confess I didn't quite understand what was going on myself. In fact, I never did uh, quite make head or tails of it until... Till Holmes took pity on me later and explained the, the whole thing. But I shan't try to confuse you, Mr. Bartell. I'll tell you the story exactly as it happened. <laughs> right you are, Doctor. Let's go. Very well. On that Christmas Eve in 86, I was standing in our Baker Street rooms, dressed in the costume of uh, Santa Claus. Holmes, his long, thin fingers pressed together, lay back in an armchair and gazed at me quizzically while our housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson, stood by the door and... Uh... Oh, Dr. Watson, you make a grand Santa Claus. <laughs> Doesn't he, Mrs. Hudson? <laughs> Try the beard on, Watson, old chap. I'm afraid this is going to be a little uncomfortable. Uh, uh, how, uh, how does it look? <laughs> oh, you look just like the old man on the Christmas cards, Doctor. <laughs> yes, Watson. It really becomes you. The cheery twinkle of the eyes, the ruddy complexion, and the uh, the appropriate girth. What a shame we can't obtain some snow on a sleigh and reindeer for you. However, I'm sure Mrs. Hudson's nieces will be very much impressed. Well, they will that, sir. 
And it's very kind of you, Doctor, to offer to come over to their house with me. Oh, no. With her father in the hospital and my sister at his bedside, it would have been a very miserable Christmas without me. Oh, you. I shall enjoy myself, but I think I'll take this beard off before we get there. That's it. Are you ready to leave, Mrs. Hudson? I am, sir. Uh, will I get a cab? How far do we have to go? Oh, Lexington Gardens, number 28. It's just off the Edgeware Road, Doctor. Well, it's not far, but bearing in mind my costume, I suppose we'd better take a cab. Aye, sir. I'll get one. Holmes, what are you going to do with yourself? I hate leaving you alone on Christmas Eve. Oh, don't worry, old chap. I shall spend a profitable evening writing on my new monograph. Well, what's this one about? An analysis of teeth marks on pipe stems, and with particular regard to indicated character. Oh, gracious me, how exciting. Well, I must be going. <laughs> don't forget your sack of presents, old fellow. No, 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 no. Uh, when you come to distribute them, you'll find that I took the liberty of adding a few trinkets on my own behalf. Oh, that's very thoughtful of you, Holmes. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Holmes, but there's a gentleman to see you. Says he's an old friend of yours. Here's his card, sir. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's Lord Whittacombe. Splendid. Ask him to come up, please, Mrs. Hudson. All right, sir. And I hope your party is a great success, Mrs. Hudson. Well, thank you, sir. Are you sure you don't want me to stay uh, now that you have a visitor? Oh, no, 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 no. Indeed, no, Mrs. Hudson. I can show the gentleman out myself. You go off and have a good time. Thank you, sir. Well, I wonder what Lord William wants. Perhaps I should stay no, and give no, you... No, no, please, a... my dear fellow. Certainly not. Well? Yeah, you have far more important work to do. Well, he can probably wants his revenge at chess. Or something equally innocuous. Off with you, my dear fellow, and enjoy yourself. Oh, I'd better go. Just to say, I wish you were coming with me. I'll, uh, I'll see you later. I shall be there. Uh, come on up, Whittacombe. Hello, Holmes. Oh, evening, Watson. You make a very convincing Santa Claus. Are you leaving? I'm afraid so, Lord Whittacombe. Well, good night, then. Uh, good night, good night, sir. How are you, Holmes? All alone on Christmas Eve, <laughs> eh? <laughs> Yes, Whittingham, I'm glad you came over to see me. Mm-hmm. What's it to be, an evening of chess, or have you unearthed some recent treasure of medieval pottery that we can discuss? Neither, Holmes. I've come to you in your professional capacity. I I need help. Oh, 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 oh. come now, Whittingham. Don't tell me that after all these years of quiet friendship, you're going to become a client? <laughs> I'm afraid so, Holmes. Though I doubt if my problem will, problem will interest you very much. It's hardly up to your uh, uh, rather colorful standards. Uh, care for a cigar? Oh, thanks. Ah. Well, now, my dear Whittacombe, what's your trouble? Well... I decided this year to have a little Christmas party at my townhouse. I'm quite comfortably off, as you know, and it occurred to me that I have several relatives and friends who are not as well off. I'm having a party for them tonight, Holmes, and I hope you'd attend it, disguised as uh, Santa Claus. Oh, my dear fellow, I've adopted many disguises in my time, but Father Christmas has never been one of them. Why do you want me to attend your party in disguise in any case? You ashamed of your friendship with a, a private detective, or um, do you consider my features more acceptable when buried beneath the depths of a snowy beard? Oh, my dear Holmes, do take me seriously. I'm not joking, I assure oh, you. Of course you're not, of course you're not. You, uh, you want me to attend your party in disguise. Why? I'm giving some very valuable presents, uh, diamond and onyx cufflinks, uh, mm-hmm. platinum and ruby earrings, and, and such like, and I've wrapped each of the presents in banknotes. Oh, dear me. Uh, where are these presents now? In a sack, in charge of my butler. I was going to dress up as Santa Claus and give them out myself, uh, until I got the warning letter. That's why I've come to you. Warning letter, eh? Yes, I received it by this evening's post. Listen to this. <clears throat> my dear Lord Whittacombe, your generosity with Christmas presents borders on ostentation. We do not approve. Either we receive 5,000 pounds in sovereigns at post restaurant. Box 379 by 6 o'clock on Christmas Eve, or I'm afraid your Christmas party will be conspicuous by its absence of presents. Let me see that note, Whittingham, will you? Yes, here you are. Thanks. Mm Mm-hmm. Plain paper, torn from a penny notebook. The writing is obviously disguised. By George, yes. Whittingham, I accept the case. I'll come with you to your party at once, and furthermore, I shall follow your suggestion regarding a disguise. Dressed as Santa Claus, I shall be less likely to attract suspicion. I'm delighted, Holmes. But uh, what made you decide so suddenly? This writing, my dear fellow, this writing. Oh, it's uh, in a false hand. I'd know that characteristic M in my dear Whittacombe. 
I've seen it too often at the beginning of a signature. Moriarty. Moriarty? Who's he? Oh, one of the cleverest and most unscrupulous criminals in England. Where'd he come? There's no time to be lost. It's, let me see now. 6.30. Half an hour beyond the deadline given you in this letter. We must go to your house at once. <laughs> This is as far as the card can take us, Doctor. Oh, here you are, Cabby. Here's five shillings for you and a, and a Merry Christmas. Oh, bless you, gentlemen, and a Merry Christmas to you, too. <laughs> uh, you said you wanted to get into the house through the back way so that you could surprise the children. Yes, I thought well, I'd tend to thought... come down the kitchen chimney. Oh, you can get to the back of the house by going up the alley here. I'll go in the front door. Splendid, splendid, Mrs. Hudson. Which is the house? Number 28. It's the third one down the alley, Doctor. I'll have the back window open in no time, and you can slip in without any of the barons seeing you. Very well. A gloomy little street, I must say. Hello. Well, where's the music coming from? Oh, it's from that temple across the street, Doctor. The Disciples of the Octagonal Square, they call themselves. What on earth do you suppose that means? Oh, some newfangled cult. Heathens, most likely. Oh, hello, hello. I'm not the only Santa Claus abroad tonight. Look at that fellow across the street over there. Oh, dressed just like yourself, Doctor, and carrying a sack, too. Oh, he, he's running up the steps to the temple. Great Scott, he, he slipped on the ice. Oh, I wonder what his hurry was. Here, here, my man. Oh, oh, oh Let be me careful help you up, now, sir. Doctor. Do not trip for yourself. Here, you are, sir. Now, give me a hand. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Felly of me, what's in it? Oh, we Santa Claus have to help each other, you know. Up you come. That's it. Oh, 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 gracious oh me. Doctor, I told you to be careful. Oh. Now you've fallen too. Oh, it's this confounded red coat of mine. It, it tripped me up. Oh. Did you hurt yourself, sir? No, 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 no. I'm all right, I think. Uh, oh. How about you, sir? Well, uh, I'm all right, thanks. Oh. Silly of me to run, wasn't it? Uh, here's your sack, sir. Well, uh, thank you. Good night and uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, good night, no, same to you, sir, same to you. Oh, he went into the temple. Must be a disciple of the octagonal square. You're sure you're no hurt, Doctor? No, no, of course not, Mrs. Hudson. Give me my sack, please. Thank you. Your sister's house is the third one down this alleyway, you say? I'll hurry and open the back window. Yes, I'll be waiting for you, Mrs. Hudson. <laughs> this is going to be rather fun. What a shame Holmes isn't with us. Oh, well, he's probably happier having a good game of chess with Lord Willicombe. This is my house, Holmes, number 39. 39 Branson Square, eh? And dear old Watson is just around the corner in Lexington Gardens and hasn't any idea that I've left Baker Street. Yes, uh, here you are, Caddy. Uh, thank you, sir. A uh, Merry Christmas, sir. Uh-huh. Listen to that. Carol singers. Yes, we'll probably have our fill of them before this evening's over. Good evening, my lord. Have the... Have the guests arrived, Hargreave? Most of them, sir. They're in the library. You brought another Santa Claus with you, I see, my lord. Another Santa Claus? What do you mean? The gentleman arrived three quarters of an hour ago, sir, dressed as Santa Claus. I took him to your study, my lord, and showed him the sack of presents. Confound it! He's got here before us. Where's this study? In this way. I hope I didn't do wrong, my lord. You told me that a gentleman dressed as Santa Claus would be coming here. Dear me, the gentleman appears to have gone. Yes, and the sack containing the presents with him. But he can't have left the house, my lord. I've been watching the front door. Yes, and while you were doing that, he slipped out through the window here. The catch is undone. Hargrave, describe this man. Well, I can't tell you much about his appearance, I'm afraid, sir. He was dressed as Santa Claus, just like yourself. But I did notice one thing about him, sir. Oh? What was that? He lisped, sir. It was quite pronounced. Of course. 
Lou the Lisper. Who on earth is Lou the Lisper? One of Moriarty's most trusted accomplices. Fortunately, though, I've had news of him lately through my underworld grapevine. You, uh, you know where he lives? He is reputed to have some uh, connections with a new cult that calls themselves the Disciples of the Octagonal Square. Their headquarters are just around the corner from here. Let, let's go there at once. Of course, and Hargrave. Yes, sir. Get a message to Scotland Yard as fast as you can. Ask for Inspector Lestrade. And tell him to join me at the Temple of the Octagonal Square in Lexington Gardens as soon as possible. Oh, the children are awful excited, Doctor. I told them you just came down the chimney. Oh, I'll slip the beard on and then I'll go into them. There we are. Will I announce you, Doctor? Yes, yes, please, Mr. Hudson. All right, sir. Now, children, quiet. Uh, Santa Claus has come to see you, and he's brought you all presents. Oh. <laughs> hello, hello, children. Oh. Hello, Santa Claus. My name's Elsie. Did you bring me a present? Oh, I, I did, Elsie. I'll look in my <laughs> sack in a minute. And uh, what's your name, young man? Herbert, they call me Bertie. Did you come down the chimney? Yes, Bertie. I bet you had a time doing it. You're so fat. Oh, <laughs> don't be rude, Bertie, or Santa Claus won't give you your present. And what's your name, little man? Maya, though. I've got a cold. Yes, I see you have. Uh, well, children, gather around me and I'll see what presents I got for you. Uh, Let me see, Bertie. Me. Uh, the uh, first present is for. No, oh, it's not be right. It says for Her Grace, the Dowager Duchess of Beulah. Oh, do you suppose Mr. Holmes has been playing a practical joke on you, Doctor? I suppose so, but I can't see the point myself. But he did say that he'd added a few trinkets of his own. I want my present. Then supposing you take this, Elsa. Oh, thank you. And this one is marked for the Reverend Arthur Carter. Okay. You what Holmes is up to. Uh, uh, here you are, Bertie. Cool, thanks. And this is for you, Lionel, because you've been a, a good little boy. This is a very big, is it? I wanted the dog. Oh, wanted the dog for Christmas. Well, I'll bring you a dog next year, Lionel. Oh, Dr. Watson. Uh, yes, Mrs. Oh, look at the wrapping on these presents, Doctor. Well, they're 20 pound notes. It's cut. Oh, oh. Cool. look what I got. Now, let me see. Why, uh, cufflinks and Doctor, diamond and onyx. What's the wrong? Ones, unless I'm very much mistaken. I got pretty earrings. Look how they sparkle. Let me see, I'll see. Oh. Good gracious, I swear that these what are diamond and rubies. What in thunder's what going on? I want my Give me back mine, too. Well, 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 well here, here you are, here Doctor you are. Dr. Watson, what do you suppose has happened? I don't know, Mrs. Hudson. Perhaps my toys are still at the bottom of the sack. I can't understand it. Oh. I wish Holmes were here instead of dozing in front of our fire in Baker Street. <laughs> you, Holmes? Here by the bed. This is the only room in the temple that gives any signs of having been lived in. I think our bird has been here, but I'm afraid he's flown. I'm sure Inspector Lestrade will get here. Strike a match, will you, Woodicombe? Right. Yeah. Here's a candle on the table. Oh, just as I feared. Look on the bed. A red coat and a beard. Yes, Lou the Lisper has discarded his disguise and gone. And with him, I'm afraid, your valuable presence. Oh, wait a minute. Here's a sack lying on the floor. Oh, no, this isn't mine. Look what's in it. A toy dog. Large box of chocolates. Little girl's dog. What in thunder? Well, this is Watson's sack. But how on earth could Lou the Lisper have got hold of it? Somewhere, somehow, he and Watson must have made an accidental change. And Lou the Lisper is no doubt trying to track Watson down at this very moment. He must work fast, Whittingham. Or my friend's life and those of Mrs. Hudson and our relatives won't be worth a tinker's damn. <laughs> Oh, now, Doctor, you can't break off your story there. Oh, yes, I can, my boy. Before I go on, I thought we'd have a glass of port just to, <laughs> to freshen us up. Oh, well, that's <laughs> that's something different. Of course. Instead of talking about port, as I <clears throat> sometimes do, it'll be nice to drink some for a change. There you are, my boy, and a, and a Merry Christmas to you. The same to you. And now, what happened next, Doctor? 
We left you at the children's Christmas party in Sherlock Holmes and Lord Whittacombe around the corner at the Temple of the Octagonal Square. Yes, Mr. Bartell, although at the time, of course, I had no idea what was going on. There I was, cheerfully handing out gifts worth well, if not a king's, at least a baronet's ransom. While outside the Temple of the Octagonal Square, Holmes and Lord Whittacombe were talking to Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. In a nutshell, Lestrade. Yeah, it seems to me, Lord Whittacombe, you'd have been wiser to get in touch with Scotland Yard when you first got the warning note. And we could have nabbed him when he came to your house and pinched the sack of presents. Lestrade, this is no time for post-mortems. We've got to reach Lou the Lisper before he finds Dr. Watson. Do you suppose he can do that, Holmes? It wouldn't be difficult. Lou the Lisper is nearly as clever as his master, Professor Moriarty. The chances are that you were followed when you came to Baker Street tonight, Whittacombe. And it's equally likely that Watson and Mrs. Hudson were followed as they left it. Moriarty seldom leaves anything to chance. Well, where did Dr. Watson go tonight? 28 Lexington Gardens. It's just around the corner from here. Well, then let's go there at once. Right now, quarry away. No, 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 Mr. We must use a little subtlety. Now, Lou the Lisper wishes to recover that sack of presents from Watson. How would he invade the party with the least possible trouble? My, uh... By dressing up as Santa Claus again. No, no, I think he's overplayed that role for one evening. Well, then how would he try to get in, Mr. Holmes? Oh, come now, Lestrade. What group of people can enter any house on Christmas Eve without invitation and without creating suspicion? The carol Exactly, singers. my dear fellow. I shouldn't be at all surprised if at this very moment Lou the Lisper and some of his gang are singing carols outside 28 Lexington Gardens. Well, then what are we going to do? Form a rival choral society. How many of your men did you bring with you? Three. A sergeant and two constables. Wearing greatcoats? <laughs> yes, Mr. Holmes, but why? Good. They can hide their helmets and pretend to be singers. Come on. Let's go over there, and while we're walking, we'll rehearse our carols. We must appear reasonably convincing. San Jure, Lestrade, San Jure. <laughs> Santa Claus? No, no, you mustn't make Santa Claus too tired, lad. Oh, that's all right, Mrs. Hudson. Hop on, Lyle, hop on. Oh, oh, oh they're singing carols outside. Oh, isn't that Can't nice. they come inside and sing for us, Santa yes, Claus? Of course they can. Ask them to come in, Mrs. Hudson, will you? All right, sir. Oh, come on, let me get on your back, too. Oh, no, no, take it easy. Oh, there we go. I want to see your reindeer, Santa. Oh, see my reindeer? Oh, my oh, dear brother, up on the roof. I'll climb up and see him. No, 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 you mustn't do that. They're asleep. Oh, here are the carol singers. Off you get, children. There we go. That's it. Now, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, and Merry Christmas. Would you like to sing some carols for the children? After that, I'm sure you'd like a drop of <laughs> something to warm you up. Well, thank you, sir. We should like that. Uh, haven't I uh, met you before somewhere, my man? Uh, no, sir, I'm sure you haven't. Uh, come on, man, let's sing Good King Went for it. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the feast of Stephen. Well, here we are outside the house, Mr. Rome. Now watch. Listen. Uh huh. Lou the Lisper and his men are already there. Are we going in now? In a moment. Now, men, you will have your truncheons handy? Yes, Mr. Holmes, we're ready. Splendid. Now, remember, when we're inside and I yell, Merry Christmas, at the top of my voice, you bring out your truncheons and get Lou the Lisper and his gang out of there as quickly as possible. Don't arrest them until you get them outside again, Mr. Hard. I don't want to frighten the children. Right you are, Mr. Holmes, we're ready. Just give us the word and we'll go in and get them. <laughs> singing. And now, how about something to warm you all up? That won't be necessary, Dr. Watson. See to the door, Sammy. Now all of you stay right where you are. Who are you? What do you think you're up to? Please don't be difficult, Doctor. All I want is the jewels out of my sack that you stole from me tonight. If you try and stop me, I shall have to hurt you. <laughs> Why do you talk so funny? You got a cold like me? Shut up. Now, Doctor, where are the jewels? Oh, oh curse it. There are some more carol singers outside. Well, I'll tell them to go away, Lou. No, better let them come in. 
If we don't, they might get suspicious. All right, Lou. I should know what you're up to. Now, no tricks, Doctor. If you try and give an alarm, I shall have to get rough with well, you. I don't mind about that, but just remember that there are children present. All right, Manny. Get over here before you, eh? Uh, what you say? We all join a little carol for the nippers, eh? Uh, well, uh, all right. Uh, w- w- what What do you want to sing? Uh, but, uh, up the old angels sing, eh? Uh, all right, all right. Uh, come on, men. Let's sing. Of the world angels sing Glory to the newborn king Merry Christmas! We are married! Doctor Watson, what's happening? They're all hitting each other with trunches. Here, you can't do that. They're all going away. They're dragging each other out. Hey, come back here. Oh, terrible. Home! Holmes, what in fun is going on? I'll explain it to you later, old chap. Lestrade! Yes, Mr. Holmes? Uh, take them to Scotland Yard and prefer charges. I'll be over in a little while and give evidence. Right you are, sir. <laughs> too bad we didn't catch Professor Moriarty, too. Well, at least we have some of his cohorts. I'll see you later, Lestrade. I wish I knew what was going on here. Is Moriarty mixed up in this business? Yes, Watson. I'll tell you all about it as soon as I've straightened this thing out. Now, uh, Whittacombe. Yes, Holmes? The 20-pound notes that you used as wrapping for your gifts seem to have been scattered all over the house. Uh, do you want me to recover them, too? No. From what you've told me of the children, I think their parents could use the money much more profitably oh. than my relatives. In any case, I can replace it. A very generous Christmas gift. Well, children, did you enjoy the, uh, little game we staged for you? It was enough fun. Yes. I nearly died laughing when they started hitting each other. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it, children. And now I, uh, I want you to show me the presents you received. I got these pretty earrings. Oh, they were a part of the game, too. A nice little girl like you doesn't want silly earrings, Elsie. Here's a beautiful doll for you. Cool. Her eyes open and shed and everything. And what did you get, my little man? These. Oh, cufflinks. Good gracious. Who wants cufflinks when he can have a, a clockwork train? You want to exchange? Train, Lord love a duck, yes. I wanted the dog. There's one for you, Lionel. A nice, nice woolly dog. Oh, oh. good. And here's a Lovely. nice... Here you are, Charlie. Here's a nice big box of chocolates, too. You can all share them. Oh, <laughs> lummy, what a night. Oh. I ain't had as much fun since Granny got her finger stuck in a plug <laughs> <laughs> I still don't understand what's going on, Holmes, but I, I must say this has all the earmarks of, of being a happy Christmas. <laughs> yes, oh, oh, oh. Mrs. Hudson. Hi, Mr. Holmes. Uh, how's, the, um, how's the turkey coming along? Oh, it'll be ready in a few minutes, Mr. Holmes. Splendid. And, and while we're waiting, perhaps the children will oblige with something we haven't heard so far this yes, evening. I know what you mean. A Christmas carol that really sounds convincing. How about it, children? All right, sir. Come on, Elsie. Come on, Lionel. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round yon virgin heart and child, holy infants of tender and fond, Doctor, that was really a twelfth, a swell story. On a Christmas Eve like this, do you ever wish you were back in Baker Street celebrating Christmas there? At times, yes, but actually, Mr. Bartell, I'm, I'm very happy right here in my little home. There on the table is a beautiful little Christmas tree. There's a fine fire in my fireplace. My two dogs, Monty and Winnie, are, are sleeping peacefully at my feet. And best of it all, I've got the love of every child in the, in the neighborhood. Yes, I got a great deal this Christmas Eve. Lots to be thankful for. And what with the troubles of the world on their way to being settled, it looks as if this is the brightest Christmas that that I've ever had. Well, that's how I feel about it too, Doctor. I hope that all our friends listening in are just as happy this Christmas Eve as we are. And speaking not only for myself, but I know for all of us and for the Petri family too, we wish every one of you a happy Christmas from the bottom of our hearts. God rest ye merry, gentlemen. Well, Dr. Watson, next Monday is New Year's Eve. 
What story do you plan to tell us? One that I think you'll find extremely appropriate, Mr. Bartell. It takes place in a Scottish castle near Edinburgh on a New Year's Eve in 1900 and concerns a pair of lovers, an elderly baronet, and a, a strange iron box that proved to be more than worth its weight in gold. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. <laughs> The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by short wave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family... The family that took time to bring you good wine invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend at Master Detective Sherlock Holmes. And now I'm sure Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's drop in and see. Him. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Drop your usual chair. Thank you. Uh, that's it. Well, did you enjoy the Christmas holidays? <laughs> well, I've, I've had a whale of a time, thank mm -hmm. you, but... I don't think I can face a turkey or a mince pie for at least another year. <laughs> How about you, Doctor? Oh, I had a very pleasant week, too, my boy. Parties, visitors, and a flattering number of Christmas messages to be answered. Oh, say, you got a new pipe. Is that a Christmas present? Yes, new pipe, new tobacco pouch, and a pound of my favorite tobacco. All of them sent to me from London by an old client and a friend of mine, Sir Ian Dunbar. An old client, huh? Well, do you mean he was one of your patients, or was he someone that you and the great Sherlock Holmes helped? The latter, Mr. Bartell. As a matter of fact, it was receiving this gift that reminded me of the story I've decided to tell you tonight. A story in which Sir Ian Dunbar played a prominent part. And how did it begin? The day before New Year's Eve in 1899, Sherlock Holmes and I sat in opposite corners of a first-class railway carriage as we sped towards Edinburgh in the Flying Scotsman. What took you and Sherlock Holmes up there, Doctor? It started off as a holiday visit, Mr. Bartell. My old friend Sir Walter Dunbar had asked Holmes and me to spend a few days with him at Dunbar Castle, about 20 miles outside Edinburgh. After we left King's Cross Station, Holmes, his sharp, eager face framed in his deer stocking cap, dipped into the bundle of fresh papers which he'd brought with him. We left Bedford far behind us before he thrust the last one of them under the seat leaned across, and offered me his cigar. Careful cigar, Watson? No, thanks, Ophel. I'll, I'll stick to the pipe. The flying Scotsman's living up to its name. We're going splendidly. Our present rate is 53 and a half miles an hour. Oh, I hadn't noticed the quarter-mile post. Nor have I, but the telegraph posts on this line are 60 yards apart. With the aid of a watch, the calculation is a simple one. Watson, my dear fellow, we have several hours ahead of us. Now, tell me more about Sir Walter Dunbar. I have a feeling that he's in some kind of trouble, or that you haven't wanted to talk about it. Well, it's not exactly trouble, Holmes, but there's a strange problem that confronts the Dunbars, a problem that'll be settled at midnight tomorrow. Oh, indeed. Night of New Year's Eve, eh? Yes, exactly, but to, to really appreciate the story, I have to begin by telling you of the death of old Sir Thomas Dunbar. The father of the present baronet, I suppose. Yes, he was severely wounded at Waterloo, though he managed to last out long enough to get back to Dunbar Castle. The story goes that as he lay there on his deathbed, 
He told his wife of his plans. Uh, dinner grave, lass. <laughs> I'll fetch the baronet's here home from Waterloo. What if I fetch the mortal wound as well? <laughs> oh, hush, lass. I'm not afraid to die. All that niggles me is that I shall never see the child you bear. Is Sir Wattle Scott no coming yet? Eh, can he visit the deathbed of his old friend? Oh, who's there? Is that you, Sandy Murdoch? Aye, right, Thomas. It's me. Aye. I'm leaving an unborn son behind me when I die. Now, I don't trust women or children or banks for that matter. Put the best part of my wealth and gold in the big iron box you'll find under the bed. The money's there. I am something else for a rainy day. You have to keep that box in trust for me, Sandy. You can turn it over to my boy on the New Year's Eve before his 21st birthday. And he'll be a man and wise enough to know how to use it. You understand, Sandy? Aye, Thomas. But supposing your bairn's a girl. A girl? I tell you, it'll be a boy. And we'll name him Walter after my good friend. Sir Walter Scott. Very interesting story, Watson. And that child, of course, is the gentleman we are going to see now, Sir Walter Dunbar. Exactly. And the first baronet was a friend of Sir Walter Scott, while his son can boast of your acquaintance. Why, it's a, it's a family singularly rich in literary friendships. That's not very funny, Holmes. Uh, to continue, I suppose you can guess what happened. Sir Thomas carefully drew up a document to specify. The New Year's Eve before the baronet's 21st birthday. And the poor child was born on February 29th. <laughs> it was a leap year. Oh, so poor Sir Walter is still waiting for his iron box full of gold. Yes, he'll be 84 next year. And yet legally, with only one birthday every four years in the eyes of the law, he'll at last be... 21. A most amusing situation, <laughs> though I'm afraid Sir Walter finds it far from entertaining. Hmm? The lawyers must have been extremely scrupulous in abiding by the letter of the document. Yes, old Sandy Murdoch is dead now, of course. But he too is a great-grandson, William Murdoch, who still handles the Dunbar estate. He'll be at the castle tonight to formally hand over the iron box. I'm delighted you accepted the holiday invitation of Sir Walter. My dear fellow, I've needed a rest, but... Uh, I've always loathed to stick to one. This situation may pose a nice little problem for me. Problem? Yes, I'm reasonably certain that the aged Sir Walter Dunbar will not get his iron box full of gold on this New Year's Eve either. But we shall see, old fellow. We shall see. <laughs> Dr. Watson, I'm glad to see you and Mr. Holmes here at the castle. Thank you, my boy. Holmes, this is Ian Dunbar, Sir Walter's grandson. How do you do, Mr. Dunbar? I'm very proud to meet you, Mr. Holmes. I've heard a lot about you. A grandfather will be down in a few moments. Let's go into the library, shall we? Well, I imagine Sir Walter's quite excited about tonight's ceremony, isn't he? <laughs> Wouldn't you be? If you'd waited 63 years too long for an inheritance. <laughs> Thank the Lord I had the foresight to be born on the prosaic date of August the 21st. Uh -huh. Even if your grandfather's death, you would be the next baronet, I take it. Yes, Mr. Holmes. You see, my father was killed two months ago at Mafeking. Yes, yes, I read about it in the papers, my boy. I'm, I'm very sorry. Thank you, Doctor. The opening of the box isn't going to be the only ceremony at midnight. Dorothy and I are announcing our engagement. Uh, Dorothy? Uh, Dorothy Small. She and her father are staying here, too. My congratulations. Yes, yes, indeed, Ian. Indeed, mine, too. <laughs> Thank you. It's uh, It's been quite a battle with her father, though. He's a businessman and isn't impressed with titles when they aren't accompanied by a suitable income. But when we told him about the inheritance, he relented and gave his consent. Ah, here's Dorothy now. Dorothy, darling, uh, I want you to meet two friends of mine. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you do? Now, how do you do, Miss Ball? Uh, how are you, my dear? From what this young man's been telling us, I, I gather that congratulations are in order. Thank you. <laughs> I finally persuaded Father that Ian would make a worthy son-in-law. For a while, I was afraid we'd have to elope to Gretna Green. <laughs> Live in a cottage on bread and cheese and law that brave the parental wrath. Just as they do in the storybooks. Oh, Sir Walter, there you are. Uh -oh. 
Watson, my dear boy. Uh, how are you? And this must be your friend Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Sir Walter? <laughs> We're a well for a young nipper who'll be 21 at midnight. <laughs> oh, uh, gentlemen, may I introduce Mr. Herbert Smith? How do you do, do, sir? I believe that we have to congratulate you on the engagement of your daughter. Hmm. That was supposed to remain a secret until midnight. Mm -hmm. The Dunbar box was finally opened. Oh, didn't be grouchy, Herbert. The children are in love, and I'm going to settle money on Ian. And it's New Year's Eve. Let's enter into the spirit of the occasion. Bring out the glasses, Ian. I've had some bottles of my special pride put out. It's the finest port in Scotland. The cream of Dunbar. I, my father laid the first bottle down the year before I was born. And a drink of the brew will surely warm the cockles of your heart. Well, my mouth's watching already, Sir Walter. <laughs> when is this uh, lawyer fellow, young Murdoch, getting here? Oh, any moment, Herbert. As soon as he arrives, we'll have dinner, and then we'll be ready for the evening ceremony. He's bringing the famous iron box with him, Sir Walter? If he doesn't, they won't get any dinner, Holmes. Ian, pass the glasses around, my boy. Ah, there you are, Murdoch. Good evening, Sir Walter. Oh, you've got the box with you, I see. Now the party's complete. Oh. Let me introduce you. Miss Small, her father, Mr. Small, my grandson, Ian, you know. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? I'm sorry I'm late, Sir Walter. My train was delayed. Oh, that's all right, my doc. You're here, and you brought the box. That's all that matters. Uh, Ian, give our young lawyer a drink. Here, I'll help you pour it. I right. must say that this is rather exciting, Holmes. The famous iron box with its inheritance of gold. Yes, and from the size of the box, at a rough guess, I should estimate its cubic content in gold at around 5,000 pounds. Not a vast sum, perhaps, to a businessman like Mr. Small, but a windfall to an impecunious Scottish baronet. Yes, I suppose it is. A strong young man, Mr. Murdoch. How do you mean strong, Holmes? A box that size, full of golden sovereigns, would weigh a considerable amount. And yet the lawyer carried it single-handed. I know that we're all assembled. I'm going to propose a toast. Though it's still some hours off yet, let's drink to the new year. It means a lot to some of us. To 1900! 1900. 1900. We should toast more than just 1900, Sir Walter. We should drink to the new century that's about to begin. Good idea, Dorothy. Oh, I'm afraid that wouldn't be quite appropriate, Miss Small. To be accurate, the 20th century won't begin until January the 1st, 1901, and not 1900. Of course. That's it. Dorothy, I'm afraid your wedding can't take place for some time yet. Father, what are you talking about? I read an article in The Guardian the other day that said just the same thing as you, Dr. Watson. And what's more, it said something even more important. It said that 1900 is not a leap year. Oh, rubbish. Leap year comes every four years. There was one in 1896, then obviously 1900 is one. I think Mr. Small may be right. What do you say, Mr. Holmes, do you know? Well, I hope no one would bring up this point, but <laughs> it's the little problem I referred to on the train, my dear Watson. Yes, Holmes, for heaven's sake, answer. Is 1900 a leap year or no? I'm afraid it's not, Sir Walter. No? <laughs> because of a slight imbalance that would otherwise be produced in the calendar. Of the even century years, only those divisible by 400 are leap years. In other words, 1600 was a leap year, the year 2000 will be a leap year, but uh, 1800 and 1900 are not leap years. Then you have no birthday next year, Sir Walter, and I'm afraid I can't open the box tonight. And the Dunbars won't get their inheritance. And you, my dear, don't marry for a few more years. I won't allow you to marry a pauper. Mr. Holmes, are you sure of your facts? I'm very much afraid that I am, young man. Oh. This is terrible. I can't stand anymore. No, no, no. Don't take it too bad, Mr. Walter. Here, here, sir. Here, drink this. Oh. Uh, that's it, after all. You only have to wait another four years. Another four years? At my age, young man. At my age. Oh, no. I shall never live that long. Hey, what is it, Angus? Dinner is prepared, Sir Walter. You can serve it as soon as you're ready, sir. <laughs> Walter's gone to his room, the young lovers are nearly in tears, and Small and the lawyer Murdoch seem to be positively gloating. Yes, a most depressing atmosphere in which to welcome the new year. But let us at least make the best of it. I think I'll go and have a talk with Sir Walter. And you, my dear chap, why not try and cheer up the young folks? Mm. Some of your experiences in India. Maybe some... 
Oh, yeah, it's quite nice, dear. I'll join you in the library. Call me if you, if you want me, Holmes. Ah, there you are, my dears. Hello, Dr. Watts. All alone in front of the fire, eh? I'm afraid we're not in very good spirits, sir. Oh, nevertheless, I'll sit down here and join you, if you don't mind. Misery loves company, you know. You're, you're very kind, Doctor. Oh, not at all. I was just trying to persuade Ian to elope with me. But he's being most ungallant. He won't even consider it. How can I, darling? I've got under 200 pounds a year in my own right. How could we live on that? I was counting on the money the grandfather was going to give us to get me started. Now, 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 Miss Small, a little earlier, you talked of Gretna Green and bread and cheese and <laughs> love in a cottage. Yes, uh, there's a lot to be said for it, you know. Well, to be said for it, yes, Doctor. But have you ever tried it? Not literally, my boy, but uh, I must tell you that when Mary, my wife, and I were first married, I had very little money. In fact, my income was just about the sum that you mentioned. And... Uh, we were very happy. Ah, but you have a profession, Doctor. Look at me. I've been trained for nothing except to be Laird of Dunbar Castle. I can't support a wife on tradition. But you're young, Ian. You can get some kind of position, I'm sure you yes, can. Yes, of course, of course. As a matter of fact, I think that... Holmes, what is it? What's wrong? The devil's work afoot, Watson. Come with me, old fellow. And you, Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Holmes, what's happened? It's Sir Walter. I went to his room. It was in darkness. But in the moonlight, I saw two figures struggling by the open casement. One of them was Sir Walter. As I entered, he disappeared from sight. His attacker had pushed him out of the window into the moat. How dread! The other man got away in the darkness. We must get lanterns and go out to the moat at once. Though I'm very much afraid, Mr. Dunbar, that your grandfather is beyond our help. Now, to get back to our story... Someone had pushed poor old Sir Walter out of his bedroom window and into the moat below. Isn't that right, Dr. Watson? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Of course, we grabbed lanterns as fast as we could and rushed outside, but it was a hopeless task. The water was eight or ten feet deep, and it seemed obvious that the elderly Sir Walter wouldn't have a chance of saving himself. But we searched on the flicker of bobbing lanterns and the scurrying figures in the frosty moonlight, forming a weird... Angus, bring a lantern over here. Aye, sir. Can you see anything, Holmes? Not a thing. Well, I don't see why your friend doesn't call the police, Dr. Watson. He's accomplishing nothing. We thought there might be a chance of finding the old man alive, Mr. Small. He wants to avoid a scandal, if possible, for your sake, sir, as well as the Dunbar. The scandal can't touch me or Dorothy over this. Her engagement was never announced. Thank heaven. That's a great pity, sir. I should think some new blood in your family would be a great improvement. You're oh, being confoundedly impertinent, Doctor. And you'll be confoundedly heartless, sir. Well, Holmes, if... Have you given up hope? I'm afraid the, the we'll never find him without dragnets and grappling hooks. I have to call the police. What time is it? Sir Ian. You know the time? What did you call me, Mr. Holmes? Sir Ian. By Jove, yes. It does seem a bit premature, Holmes, but of course you're right. If your poor grandfather's dead, Mr. Dunbar, you're the baronet now. And the time, Sir Ian? It's, it's a quarter to twelve, Mr. Holmes. A quarter of an hour to the new year. Sir Ian, doesn't that fact suggest something to you? Yes. Yes, it does. So I'm the new baronet, am I? Very well, then. There'll be no more talk of the police for 15 minutes. I want all of you to come back to the castle with me. As the last chime of midnight rings out, I shall have a statement to make. A statement that I want you all to hear. <laughs> He brought us all back here for home. There's something very funny going on. I tell you, I don't like the look of it. And I, Watson, like the look of it very much. I wish you wouldn't be so dashed mysterious. What are you up to? You haven't taken a step yet towards finding the murderer? Haven't I? And I wonder what causes the beads of perspiration on Mr. Small's brow. Small? You mean that Small... Yes, and I wonder point? what causes the singular look of apprehension on the face of Murdoch, the young lawyer. You remember, of course, on my remarking how easily he carried the large iron box. Chris Scott, yes. And it took a strong man to throw Sir Walter out of the window. What? Huh? The new year is approaching. Ladies and gentlemen, in view of our recent tragedy, this is one New Year's Eve when none of us feels like song and jollity. But there still remains a ritual duty for me to perform. Mr. Murdoch? 
Open the iron box, please. But, but, but I can't do that. It was only to be opened for your grandfather. No, Mr. Murdoch. The phrase was that it was to be opened on the New Year's Eve before the baronet's 21st birthday. I am now the baronet, and I shall be 21 next year on August 21st. Open the box, please, Mr. Murdoch. Ian, darling, how practically clever of you. Good lad, I hope you think of it. Sir Ian. Murdoch, open that box. Very well, Sir Ian. But I'm afraid you're in for something of a shock. Great, Scott, the the box is empty. Except for a sheet of note paper in the bottom. What's the meaning of this, Murdoch? Read that paper, Sir Ian, and you'll understand. I owe you 4,000 sovereigns. And it's signed Alexander Murdoch on behalf of Murdoch and Murdoch, lawyers. You'd better explain this. It's the family skeleton, Sir Ian. That note is signed by my great-grandfather, the one that witnessed the original deed concern in the box. As soon as Sir Walter was born on that February the 29th, my great-grandfather realized the money wouldn't have to be produced for 84 years. And so he stole it. He borrowed it. He always intended to pay it back, but he was never able to. When he died, he told my father of his secret, and my father in turn told me. We've always planned to put back the money, Sir Ian, but we've never been able to. This is daylight robbery. You should prosecute them, Ian. The firm's still in business. You can ruin them. You can sue them for every penny they have. Mr. Small, you've already shown a marked aversion to my family. I suggest you allow me to handle their affairs. Bravo, Ian. How dare you, Dorothy? Go to your room. No one's going to their room. No one's leaving here until the police arrive. I'm convinced that one of you murdered my grandfather tonight. And if you ask me, it's obvious who that someone is. Who, Dr. Watson? You, Mr. Murdoch. You came here planning to kill poor old Sir Walter because you never intended to open that box. You thought that your secret would die with him. That's a lie. I was going to tell him everything and then ask for time to pay the money. I didn't kill him. Of course he didn't. There's your murderer. You yourself, Ian. Father, what are you saying? I'm saying that Ian's the murderer. He saw that the box wasn't going to be open for another four years... He realized that the money couldn't marry Dorothy, so he killed his grandfather and then ordered the box open. You're trying to cover yourself. You pushed grandfather out of that window tonight. You thought that if he died, the box would never be opened. So Dorothy couldn't marry me. You, you, you young weapon. Gentlemen, 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 please. Upon my soul, Holmes, you seem remarkably calm. Do I, my dear Watson? I must say I'm absolutely fascinated by listening to three people accusing each other of murder. And each of them producing perfectly sound motives. It's a remarkable example of the dangers of reasoning from motive alone. We should profit by experience, Watson. Mr. Holmes, how can you be so calm? There's a murderer in this I room. I suppose this game of charades is getting a little out of hand, Miss Small. Let's conclude it. You'd better come out now. <gasps> that tapestry, it's moving. A happy new year to you all. Grandfather. Sir Walter, how am I seeing a ghost? Oh, Sir Walter, you're all right. Well, what kind of a game have you been playing? It's a bunny game that Holmes and I invented. You might call it forcing the issue. I was determined to have the box open before the next four years were out, whilst I was still alive to look inside it. But the trickery of your family, Murdoch, has made me a very unhappy man. Sir Walter, I shall pay back the money in a few years. I swear I will. It'll be too late to do me any good. But I'll take care that Ian gets it. I've half a mind to prosecute you. Grandfather, the money isn't important now that you're all right. Uh, You were counting on it just the same, my boy. So that you could marry Dorothy. I know that. Uh, She'll never marry a pauper. I won't allow it. When I'm 21, you can't stop me, Father. And I am going to marry Ian. Be quiet. Sir Walter, it's a very unsavory business. Uh, I think that you owe us an explanation of your behavior tonight. You tell him, Holmes. I fancy a wee drop of cream of Dunbar... Watching you all search for my body in the moat has made me thirsty. (laughs) The explanation is a very simple one, ladies and gentlemen. When you arrived here tonight, Mr. Murdoch, I knew from the way you handled the box that it could not contain the sum of gold it was supposed to. And so you you suspected fraud and devised a plan to force the opening of the box, Yes, and Sir Walter was an eager conspirator. Of course I was. Ian is 21 next August. Supposing, Supposing I had died after he came of age and before my next birthday, four years hence... The box would never have been open. And so we invented the fake murder story. By the way, Ian, I must congratulate you for grasping the possibilities of the situation so speedily. If you hadn't demanded the opening of the box, the Murdoch secret might still be a secret. It was a clever plan, Holmes. It's too bad that it had to have such a miserable ending. I'm not sure that we have finished with the matter. Uh, Mr. Murdoch. Yes, Mr. Holmes. You say that your family took £4,000 from that box? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Curious. I would have sworn from its size that it would hold closer to 5,000. And in your account of the legend, Watson, you told me that Sir Thomas Dunbar 
stated on his deathbed that he had put something else in the box. <laughs> something for a rainy day, is that yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Did the Murdochs find that extra something? No, Mr. Holmes. They found nothing but the gold. Oh, that's very odd. I think I'll take a closer look at that box if you don't mind. Since this seems to be a night of telling secrets, I think you might as well know, Father, that if you don't give your consent, I shall elope with him. Oh, bravo, my dear, bravo. No such thing. <laughs> I admire your resolution, young lady, but I hardly think it will be necessary. What do you mean, Holmes? Permit me to show you all the treasure of the Dunbars. What have you found, Holmes? The something for a rainy day that old Sir Thomas spoke of. You see... Since the cubic contents of the box obviously differed from my calculations, I deduced the existence of a false bottom. I was correct. And in that space, I found this. Oh, it's a manuscript. Quite so, the manuscript of a book. Look at the title page and see the author's name. Uh, History of the Dunbar family. By Sir Walter Scott. Scott. I think, Sir Walter, that an original and unpublished manuscript by your distinguished namesake will prove worth several times the gold that is missing from that box. You've saved the day for us, Holmes, my boy. God bless you. Oh, oh, this has been a stranger new year as ever I knew. But it's turned out to be a bonny one, thanks to you, Holmes. Well, fill up your glasses. We're going to drink a toast to the New Year. Ah, oh, Joe, yes, Sir Walter. This is really a happy occasion. Then <laughs> let's complete it by singing the traditional song of the season, Old Lang Syne. And in this case, when we sing, Should Old Acquaintance Be Forgot, I feel that in our hearts we should be thinking of Sir Walter Scott. Though he died over 60 years ago, he's made us all very happy here tonight. Uh... Should old acquaintance be forgot and never run to Doctor, that turned out to be a very happy new year for all concerned. Yes, that's one new year that I'll never forget. Well, I sure hope you'll always remember this one, too. Oh, just a second, my boy. That calls for a glass of port. Fine. Uh, well, to a, to a happy new year, my boy, for you and for our many friends listening in. And to you, Doctor. Oh, thanks, my boy. <laughs> ah, that's good. Doctor, this has indeed been a pleasant association for me. Oh, I'm glad to hear. You're the best storyteller I've ever known, and the Petri family makes the best wine I've ever tasted. <laughs> I hope that, just as they've been making wine for generations in the past, the Petri family will continue to make fine wine in the future. Uh, uh, Mr. Bartell, I know that you'll always be here to tell us just how good that Petri wine is. <laughs> well, I hope so, Doctor. <laughs> and I hope you'll always be right here beside me to... Tell another swell story about oh, Mr. Holmes. So too, my boy. <laughs> oh, and incidentally, Doctor, what new adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a weird story. It starts with a series of murders on Hampstead Heath and ends with a battle to the death in a burning waxworks. I call it the strange case of the murderer in wax. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Silver Blades. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. <laughs> Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family.